Members, the Senate will come to order. Members, we have a couple uh, addendums. So I'm going to start and revert back to the third order of business. Messages from the House. The Secretary will read the first message. Mr. President, I have the honor to inform the Senate that the House of Representatives invites and is ready to meet with the Senate in joint convention on Monday, May 1st, 2023 at 6 o'clock p.m. for the purpose of electing members to the Board of Regents of the University of Minnesota. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Senator Kunish for a motion. Mr. President, I move that the Senate accept the invitation of the House of Representatives to meet in joint convention in the House chamber on May, Monday, May 1st, 2023 at 6 p.m. for the purpose of electing members to the Board of Regents of the University of Minnesota. Members, uh, uh, Senator Kunis moved that, that the Senate accept the invitation of the House of Representatives to meet in joint convention in the House Chambers on Monday, May 1st, 2023 at 6 p.m. for the purpose of electing members to the Board of Regents of the University of Minnesota. All, all in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed, say no. no. The motion prevails. The Secretary will read the next message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce that the House has acceded to the request of the Senate for the appointment of a conference committee consisting of five members of the House on the amendments adopted by the House to the following Senate file. Senate file number 2995, a bill for an act relating to state government, modifying provisions governing child care, child safety and permanency, child support, economic assistance, deep poverty, etc. There has been appointed a such committee on the part of the House, Liebling, Beerman, Pinto, Keeler and Schumacher. Senate file number 2995 is herewith returned to the Senate. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Members, remember, no action is required. The Secretary will read the next message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce that the House has acceded to the request of the Senate for the appointment of a conference committee consisting of three members of the House on the amendments adopted by the House to the following Senate file. Senate file number 2744, a bill for an act relating to commerce establishing a biennial budget for the Department of Commerce. There has been appointed as such committee on the part of the House, Stevenson, Katizia Watoon, and O'Driscoll. Senate file number 2744 is herewith returned to the Senate. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. No action is required. The Secretary will read the next message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce that the House has acceded to the request of the Senate for the appointment of a conference committee consisting of five members of the House on the amendments adopted by the House to the following Senate file. Senate file number 2909, a bill for an act relating to state government, providing for certain judiciary, public safety, corrections, human rights, firearm, clemency, rehabilitation and reinvestment, et cetera. There has been appointed as such committee on the part of the House, Mueller, Feist, Becker, Finn, Frazier, and Curran. Senate file number 2909 is herewith returned to the Senate. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Members, no action required. The Secretary will read the next message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce that the House refuses to concur in the Senate amendments to House file number 2887. House file number 2887, a bill for an act relating to transportation, establishing a budget for transportation. The House respectfully requests that a conference committee of five members be appointed thereon. Hornstein, Cagle, Tapke, Brand, and Petersburg have been appointed as such committee on the part of the House. House file number 2887 is herewith transmitted to the Senate with a request that the Senate appoint a like committee. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Senator Debo for motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that the Senate accede to the request of the House for a conference committee on House file number 2887, and that a conference committee of five members be appointed by the subcommittee on conference committees on the part of the Senate to act with a like conference committee appointed on the part of the House. Member Senator, Den uh, Senator Dibble moved that the Senate accede to the request of the House for a conference committee on House file number 28, uh, 2887, and that a conference committee of five members be appointed by the subcommittee on conference committees on the part of the Senate to act with a like conference committee appointed on the part of the House. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. The motion prevails. The secretary will read the next message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce that the House refuses to concur in the Senate amendments to House file number 2292. 
House File Number 2292, a bill for an act relating to early childhood, pro modifying provisions for early learning scholarships, etc. The House respectfully requests that a conference committee of three members be appointed thereon. Pinto, Perez Vega, and Daniels have been appointed as such committee on the part of the House. House File Number 2292 is herewith transmitted to the Senate with a request that the Senate appoint a like committee. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Senator Kunish, for a motion. Mr. President, I move that the Senate accede to the request of the House for a conference committee on House File 2292 and that a conference committee of three members be appointed by the subcommittee on conference committees in on the part of the Senate to act with like conference committee appointed on the part of the House. Member Senator Kunis moved that the Senate accede to the request of the House for a conference committee on House File Number 2292 and that a conference committee of three members be appointed by the subcommittee on conference committees on the part of the Senate to act with a like conference committee appointed on the part of the House. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The Secretary will read the next message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce the passage by the House of the following House file herewith transmitted. House file number 1938, signed Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Members, no action is required. We will now move to the fourth order of business. The House files have been given its first reading and referred as indicated. <laughs> Members, we will now proceed to the fifth order of business, which is the report of committees. Senator Kunish for a motion to adopt committee reports. Mr. President, I move that the committee report printed on the agenda be adopted. On that motion, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. <laughs> Members, we'll now proceed to the sixth order of business, which is the second reading of Senate bills. The secretary will read the Senate file numbers. Senate file number 1811. The Senate files have been given a second reading. Moving to the ninth order of business, Senator Latz for a motion. Mr. President, uh, I move that Senate file 33 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and re referred to the Committee on Rules and Administration. Uh, I'm the uh, chief author of the bill. Um, the uh, chairs are in agreement that this ought to happen. Members, this is the revisers bill. It was erroneously referred to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, it should be in rules uh, where the revisers' amendments will be adopted before we move on. Member Senator, the last move that Senate file number 3307 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and re referred to the Committee on Rules and, Admi and Administration. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Remaining under, under the order of business of motions and resolutions, Senator uh, Kunish. Mr. President, pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bill be made a special order for immediate consideration. Members, the special orders list is on your desk. We're going to start with General Orders Number 150, which is House File 100, which is, which is done by Senator Port. Cannabis provisions modifications. To that end, Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I am thrilled to present House File 100, Senate File 73, the Adult Use Cannabis Legalization Bill. The prohibition of cannabis is a failed system that has not achieved the desired goals and has had incredible costs for our communities, especially for communities of color. We have an opportunity today to vote green to undo some of the harm that has been done and create a unique system of regulation that works for Minnesota consumers and businesses while ensuring an opportunity in this new market for communities that have been most affected by prohibition. Our main goals are to legalize, regulate, and expunge, and this bill does just that. This bill establishes an Office of Cannabis Management to oversee the regulation of cannabis and cannabinoid products and transfers the medical cannabis to this new office. It establishes a Cannabis Advisory Council, requires specific studies and reports, and sets up a statewide monitoring system. The bill also creates an approval process for cannabis products and hemp-derived consumer products, 
establishes plant propagation standards and agricultural best practices and environmental standards. Additionally, the bill provides legal limits for adult use cannabis products, establishes categories of licenses and related fees and legal framework. We establish a social equity program to ensure communities most harmed by prohibition have an opportunity to engage in the industry. We provide grower grants and invest in substance use disorder treatment and recovery, prevention, treatment, and recovery. Senate File 73 sets the tax rate for cannabis products, provides business development grant programs, allows for reasonable levels of local control, sets up automatic expungement programs, as well as an expungement panel for higher level offenses, and puts in temporary regulation for the changes that we made last year. We also provide guidelines around testing, packaging, labeling, and advertising. This bill is comprehensive, to say the least. The suggestions and meeting requests related to cannabis began pouring in on day one of the session. My calendar documents 3,325 minutes spent in 109 meetings to work on this bill. We set up an online forum where anyone could submit the recommended changes, and we fielded over 300 suggestions. We hashed out those recommendations together as a body over 30 hours in a marathon of 14 committee hearings. Throughout those hearings, we adopted 65 amendments in a true bipartisan effort. Of those 65 amendments, 22 of them, one third, came from my friends across the aisle. Before our second hearing in Commerce, Senator Rasmussen knocked on my door to talk through the amendments he planned to offer, and I accepted four of them. They were good ideas. This inspired me to offer time to GOP colleagues before committee hearings to sit down and really discuss how we could improve the bill together. I want to thank Senators Rasmussen, Dames, Duckworth, Anderson, Jasinski, Howe, Lang, Coleman, and Abler for their good faith amendments that helped make this bill the best it can be for all Minnesotans. I also want to thank my DFL colleagues who all but one heard this bill in committee most multiple times, uh, multiple times. Uh, carrying this bill for our caucus has been an incredible honor, and I want to send a special thank you to my buds, Aaron Murphy and uh, Claire umover Baton, who were my co-presenters on several committees so I could chair my own committee. This bill started its journey in Judiciary and Public Safety Committee way back in January. We started in judiciary because we strongly believe there can be no legalization without expungement. The harm of incarceration has been borne primarily by communities of color, especially black men, even though in study after study, black people and white people use cannabis at similar rates. The disproportionate rates of arrest, prosecution, and incarceration in the black community have had far-reaching effects on employment opportunities, housing, education, family stability, and wealth building, to name just a few. I want to share a story from Tanya. Tanya is the first formerly incarcerated person appointed to the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. She wrote to me and talked to me about this and told me her story. At 18, she was charged and convicted of a felony possession of marijuana. She was in an abusive relationship, and her boyfriend at the time, unknown to her, stashed five pounds of marijuana in her basement ceiling. That felony conviction set her life on a very rough pathway. This was before Ban the Box, so she was red-lettered as a felon on every job application. She was unable to obtain employment, even at fast food restaurants. She was a young mother, and was no longer eligible for public housing. Nor was she eligible for FAFSA due to her conviction, so higher education was out of the question. This set her life on a downward spiral for many years. The constant fight against homelessness, joblessness, and emotional shame. The prohibition of cannabis has harmed not just her life, but her children who also suffer collateral consequences. Members, we have a responsibility to right this wrong. And Minnesotans are watching, literally. When the House 
the other body passed the companion bill earlier this week, over 2,300 people were tuned into the live stream. Minnesotans are ready. Attitudes are changing. Now is our time to undo decades of ineffective and damaging prohibition. And Mr. President, I have the A8 amendment. Senator Port offers the A, what was the number? Eight. A8 amendment. The secretary will report the A8 amendment. Senator Port moves to amend House file number 100. The first unofficial engrossment as follows. Page 56, line seven, before the second eight, insert more than. This is the A8 amendment. Senator Port to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President and members. This is a technical amendment. Uh, lines 1.3 through 1.6 are suggestions from the reviser. Uh, 1.7 through 110 are clear, uh, clearing up suggestions from the Re uh, Finance Committee last week. Uh, 1.13 is a and fixing an error on the date, uh, same for 1.19. Um, and uh, the other lines, uh, the sections 1.14 and uh, from 1.22 down to the bottom are all edits to clarify uh, the conversation we had in finance about ensuring that the uh, revolving loans uh, account is set up correctly. I ask for a green vote. Any other discussion on the A8 amendment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. The motion prevails. The A8 is adopted. Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Mr. President. I offer the A11 amendment. Senator Hostia offers the A11 amendment. The secretary will report the A11 amendment. Senator Hostchild moves to amend House File Number 100, the first unofficial engrossment, as follows. Page 37, line 7, after May, insert. This is the A11 amendment. Senator Hostchild to your A11 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. And before I begin, I ask for a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Housechild. Thank you, Mr. President. I first want to thank Senator Port for taking into consideration the concerns of local governments throughout this process. I know because I often talk to local governments in my district uh, and have to remind them that the Senate bill is vastly different from the House bill in that regard. I also reflect back on my time as a city councilor um, and know how important it is that our local communities can make decisions on behalf of their needs. I'm appreciative of the work that Senator Port and Senator Gustafson have done regarding local control throughout this session on this bill. And this amendment specifically focuses on making sure that the zoning authorities of local governments are crystal clear. The A11 amendment would clarify sections 13 and 14 to make sure that we're clear that governments have the ability to utilize their regulatory authorities and place reasonable restrictions related to hours of operation, noise, odor, and location. This amendment also clarifies the local restrictions on number of cannabis retailers, which is an important request from our local governments. This amendment was requested and supported by local government associations representing hundreds of cities uh, from the LMC, as well as 87 counties by AMC, and I ask for your support of this critical local control amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Any other discussion on the A11 amendment? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Housechild yield for a question? Senator Housechild, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Housechild. Senator Housechild, could you um, explain or, or describe who has seen this language and who is in support of the A11 amendment? Senator Housechild, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, obviously, the author, Senator Port, has seen this language, as well as AMC and LMC. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Any further discussions on the A11 amendment? Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Um, I want to direct you to a letter uh, on your desk as well from uh, LMC and AMC. It's the top letter in the packet that you got. Um, I want to request a green vote for this amendment. This is clarifying language uh, to ensure that our intent, uh, as we have worked over the last few months with the League of Minnesota Cities and the Association of Minnesota Counties, who have been excellent partners in this, uh, is clarified and correct in the way that they need. Um, I support this amendment. 
Senator Pratt to the A11. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I continue to be concerned with the preemption of our local governments, our cities and counties to decide whether they want cannabis in, in the retailers in their, in their uh, jurisdictions or not. And this continues to force cities, while they can say they don't want a vape shop or they don't want a tobacco shop, they cannot deny a similar type of shop that focuses on cannabis. We are stripping away the ability of our local communities to say if, whether or not they want these establishments or not. Even when Colorado passed this law many, many years ago, they allowed local communities to opt out to decide whether or not they wanted these, these, uh, these retailers in their, in their jurisdiction. And at the time, about 75% of, of uh, communities decided they didn't want it. Now, that's slowly gone back down, and I think we're closer to a 50-50 split in Colorado. But the idea that we are preempting the locals from even deciding whether they want this, when they can do the very same thing for tobacco, they can do the very same thing for liquor, but they have to have cannabis. And I think it's wrong for us to preempt our local jurisdictions, and this just reinforces that, uh, that preemption. Any additional discussions on the A11? Who is it? Oh, Senator Nelson. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, I have some concerns in that it looks like, uh, looking at uh, the language 37.10, we are eliminating the ability for a local unit of government to prohibit a cannabis business within 500 feet of a school, daycare, or park. That is significant and uh, should... Um, bring warning bells to all of us. Senator Abler. Thanks, Mr. President. I was uh, met, uh, somebody talked to me about this yesterday. Uh, if you don't like the way the bill is, if it's too restrictive, this makes it less restrictive. So if you want to keep the bill the way it is and worse or make it better, from my point of view, where there's more flexibility, this is that amendment. Thank you. Any other discussion? Senator Hochschild, you are the author of the amendment. You get the last word. Thank you, Mr. President. I would just reiterate that this is strongly supported by AMC and LMC. We've had thoughtful conversations. Senator Port has been involved with this since the very beginning of this bill, having these conversations with our local governments. This is the right approach. They approve, and, and let's vote green. Thank you, Mr. President. The Secretary will take the roll on the A11 Amendment. Members, please vote. Senator Morrison, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Bolden votes aye. Senator Bowden votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Mitchell votes aye. Senator Mitchell votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Seeberger votes aye. Senator Seeberger votes aye. Uh, Senator Rest did vote in person. Uh, Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Housley votes no. Senator Housley votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Weber votes no. Senator Weber votes no. And Senator Westrom votes aye. And Senator Westrom votes aye. All 
All having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 38 ayes and 28 noes. The A11 amendment is adopted. Any further amendments? Uh, Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Mr. President. I introduce the A5 amendment. Senator Hochschild offers the A5 amendment, and the secretary will report the A5 amendment. Senator Hochschild moves to amend House File Number 100. The first unofficial engrossment as follows. Page 155, line 26, delete 10, and insert 12. This is the A5 amendment. Senator Hochschild, to your A5 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Before I begin, I'd like to ask for a roll call. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Mr. President. This amendment would increase the gross receipt sales tax from 10% to 12% and then scale up the tax starting in 2028 by 1% each year until it reaches 20%. The amendment would also increase the local government share of the gross receipts tax from 25% to 30%. As we can see in this bill, there are several areas that we are asking our local governments to assist and partner with us in regards to the legalization of adult use cannabis. Land use and zoning, compliance enforcement, public safety responses, local public health outreach, and education. I know the author has been in routine communication with our local government partners and has already taken many local government concerns into consideration regarding the land use and zoning requests. This revenue would be split equally between counties and cities and largely dedicated by total amount of licenses. We know when looking at the original local cannabis aid amounts with the 10% tax rate that this wouldn't cover the full impacts on local governments, so this is a meaningful recognition of those costs. I believe this is an important amendment that says we hear the concerns brought forward by our cities and counties, see our local governments as partners, and support them as being part of this new industry. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Port, to the 11. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, through this process, I have talked uh, many times, for those of you who have been in committee with me, about the need to keep the tax on cannabis low enough that we don't outprice the illicit market and, uh, you know, give an opportunity for that illicit market to keep a foothold. Um, I have worked and, and want to thank Senator Hochschild for his willingness to work with me on this. I am uh, comfortable with this language, if not enthusiastic, uh, because I do think it gives us some time to get the regulated market up and running before we really increase the tax. So I encourage members to vote their districts on this, um, how you, you feel you need to, um, and want to thank Senator Hochschild for his work on this. Any other discussion on the A5 amendment? Senator Grudenhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, it's just interesting to me, members, how we want to keep taxes lower on marijuana because it might negatively affect the industry. Maybe if we applied that to the rest of the state, we might see a faster growth in the private sector. It does seem like a little bit of a hypocrisy, although uh, I'll leave it up to each member to decide. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I would like Senator, if, would Senator Hochschild yield, please? A few questions. Senator Hochschild, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Nelson. Yes, looking at these uh, amendments on the fly, I just have a, a couple questions here. Uh, number one, uh, it look, what is the distribution and how are you changing that? I understand the A5 is increasing the tax from 10 to 12 percent. I'd like to know about the distribution of that additional 2 percent. Uh, Senator Hochschild, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. It's the same distribution as the 2 percent uh, from 8 percent to 10 percent. It just adds on to 12 percent, and it's distributed by number of licenses equally to county and cities. Overall, it's 30 percent of the overall uh, gross receipt tax. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. There also is some language in uh, the bill that, or in your amendment, I'd like you to describe so members have that in front of them, um, lines 1.11 through 1.14 on your amendment. Um, what is being deleted, not just the number B, but what language is being deleted and what is being inserted? in line 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, and 1.14. Senator Hochschild, to the question. 
Thank you, Mr. President and Senator Nelson. Um, so some of the lines that you're describing just reorder some of the lettering, and then the other change is just changing and clarifying that now that we're going up to 12%, it, the local governments will get 30% from 25% of the local gross receipts tax. Uh, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, Senator Hostchild. And then on uh, line... Are you asking them to continue to yield? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Hostchild, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And then um, for clarity for the body, what is being deleted? Uh, 75 is now being replaced with 70. Uh, Senator Hostchild. Senator Hostchild. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Nelson. So again, what we're doing here is we are increasing the tax, the gross receipts tax from 10% to 12%, and that paragraph, the lines that you are describing further clarifies that the local governments will then get, or excuse me, the, um, the general fund that's not going to local governments will get 70% rather than 75%, because the local governments will now get 30%. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. And one final question, if uh, the senator would yield, please. Will you yield? He will yield. Uh, senator Nelson. Thank you. So the genesis of these questions is I would like to know in total if the uh, ratio is changing. Uh, so in other words, the 2%, the added 2% tax, I want to know, is it continuing to be distributed as in the bill prior to this A5 amendment? Or you may have answered this, is one entity getting less of the additional 2% or the additional 2%? Just describe how that is being distributed, please. Senator Hauschild. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Nelson. The formula is staying the same before the amendment. However, local governments will now get more money as a overall percentage because of the taxes increasing. I hope that answers your question. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President and Senator Hostchild. I appreciate that. I needed to know that regarding the formula. Thank you. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Hostchild yield for a question? Senator Hauschild, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Hauschild. Um, and I apologize. A, a, few, uh, a few numbers and percentages be thrown around, so the question's fairly simple. Um, what, what is the maximum uh, tax threshold that this amendment would, would allow for as it relates to taxing cannabis? Uh, Senator Hauschild. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. The gross receipts tax would eventually have a maximum tax of 20%. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Housechild. I appreciate that. And I would direct members' attention to a letter in our packets from Americans for Prosperity. Uh, toward the end of that letter in bold, they state, they state that studies show that the legal market can only compete up to a taxable threshold of 15% before consumers divert their business to the illicit market. And so I think, uh, other than the, the mentions reasoned by, uh, mentioned by Senator Grudenhagen earlier as it relates to taxes and keeping them low, I think there might be another reason uh, or another discussion regarding tax rates and how we might approach the taxing of cannabis here in the state and whether or not we allow it to get up to 20 percent. Um, I think states like California serve as a good example for this. Um, you know, the, the business of doing cannabis in that state has become so expensive uh, that some reports estimate that only 20% of the cannabis market there is actually being conducted legally and that 80% is being conducted in the illicit market because the costs, uh, whether it's to get a license or the taxes involved, are so expensive and burdensome that uh, it's forcing a lot of folks into the illicit market. So, Mr. President, uh, I'll wrap up by saying, you know, we're going to continue to have a conversation and debate regarding the, the legalization of cannabis and such. But we have, to, we have to be mindful and learn lessons from other states that if, if the state of Minnesota approaches this and makes it so expensive and so costly and adds so much tax to it, that we might have the unintended consequence of exacerbating that illicit market even more, which we know is not going to go away entirely. Thank you. Senator Umu Verbaden. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't support this amendment. I. Um, believe that the tax rate on this bill is very important to get right. We want to make sure that we're moving from 
an illicit marketplace that we currently have to a regulated one, and that the tax rate is helping us create that new regulated market, that it's paying for that. Um, we need to make sure that our local uh, municipalities have funds as well uh, to do that enforcement, and Senator Port has taken those amendments throughout this committee process to ensure that we have those funds. This is too high, and frankly, I believe anything higher needs to go directly to the community's most harm. That's the reason why I got on this bill, is to make sure primarily communities of color who have been harmed by the prohibition on cannabis are able to benefit when we create this new marketplace. So I encourage members to vote no on the amendment. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. President. I was wondering if uh, Senator Hofstadt would yield for a question. Senator Hofstadt, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Senator Hofstadt. Well, my question is, does this apply to hemp and cannabinoid uh, realtors also, this increase the tax? Senator Hofstadt, did you hear the question? Uh, Senator Hofstadt. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dornick. Yes. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Senator Hofstadt. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. And I think this amendment brings up actually an important factor around the debate today, which is I believe we don't yet have a local impact um, for this bill. We don't know what the ultimate cost is going to be for local units of government. And I think this amendment brought by Senator Housechild is an acknowledgement that there will be uh, additional costs for local units of government. But at least as far as I know, we haven't received any detailed analysis on what that cost would be. And so I think this is another reason why we're not ready for this uh, bill today. And um, you, know, you can pick a, a number, but without the information on what this is actually gonna cost local units of government, um, I don't think this fixes their problems. Aaron, uh, Senator Aaron Mayquait. Thank you, Mr. President, and I really just want to reiterate what Senator Umu Verbaten said. In 1994, John Ehrlichman, who was um, President Nixon's domestic policy advisor, he admitted in an interview that um, they couldn't make it illegal to be black or to be against the war, but we could get the public to associate um, blacks and hippies with marijuana and heroin, and we could criminalize both heavily. We could disrupt their meetings and their communities. We could arrest their leaders. We could raid their homes, and we could vilify them night after night after night on the news. And so when Senator Uma Verbaten talks about if we're going to have more money um, come from the taxation on adult use cannabis, we like the harm that was cost, the costs, if you want to talk about human costs, are those communities that were disrupted, the people who were vilified night after night after night on the news. He ended by saying, did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. And so we have in front of us a bill to try to repair that harm. And if we're going to have more money come out from the taxes of the adult use cannabis, it should go to repairing that harm. So I encourage a no vote on this. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Senator Nelson. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Marty yield for a question? Senator Marty, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Marty, a, uh, a local impact note has been requested, and according to Senator Hostile, this is supposed to help cover the costs that uh, cities and counties will incur. Can you tell me, based on that local impact note, whether or not this is enough to cover those costs? Senator Marty, to the question. Mr. President, Senator Pratt, I have not seen that. As you know, those local impact statements take a long time. I think Senator Hauschild is saying he believes there are costs. We know there are costs of any decisions we make here, and he's trying to do what he thinks is a fair balance of how we cover those costs. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Marty. Well, I think we've heard the answer. We've requested a local impact note. We've asked for empirical data to say what the cost that will be incurred by our local cities and counties will be so that we can set an appropriate tax rate, so we can set an appropriate distribution. Senator Hostile Amendment is no better than what we've got in the existing bill. It's just hopes and wishes that we cover it. For some reason, the majority is putting their head in the sand when it comes to the real cost that are going to be that are going to be absorbed by our local communities. They're not waiting for that local impact note to come back. 
to tell us what the real impact, what the real costs are going to be. I'm quite honestly torn on this, Mr. President, because I'd like to see our cities and counties get more money, but yet we still don't have any empirical evidence that this is enough, this is the right distribution. It's just all hopes and wishes. The last voice we hear is that of Senator Hochschild, who is the author of the O. Uh, Senator Muhammad. Sorry, Mr. President. Senator Pratt is really tall, so he was blocking me. Um, you know, some of us are voting on this bill today. First of all, to what Senator Rasmussen said earlier, which is this bill is not ready, that is not correct. This bill is ready and has been ready for a long time. It is long overdue. Um, and to the amendment, I'm with Senator Umu Verbeaton and Senator McQuaid on this. I will be voting no. And that is because there's been a harm that's been done for decades, and we haven't done that. We have not undone the harm. I understand why Senator Hostra brought this forward, and yes, our counties and our cities should be able to benefit from this, but it should be our communities who should be benefiting this first, and I think this is really regressive. Senator Hochschild will have the last word on the A5 amendment. Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I appreciate Senator Duckworth's comments in particular regarding this amendment. Um, part of the reason the way this amendment is drafted is to help the market get established. Um, and so the increase in the tax from 12% would not start until 2028, uh, which I think would be helpful in uh, stamping out the illicit market. In addition to that, part of the reason that we have seen the illicit market thrive in other states is because they prohibit it in certain localities. So this is really a balanced approach to giving our local communities that local control that they've been asking for through their associations, but also having a, um, a process for which the tax increase when the industry is better established. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, parliamentary inquiry, has a roll call been requested on this? A roll call has been requested. Thank you. Members, the secretary will take the roll on the A5 amendment. Members, please vote. <laughs> Senator Morrison, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Bolden votes no. Senator Bolden votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Mitchell votes no. Senator Mitchell votes no. Uh, let me start over, Mr. President. Senator Bolden votes aye. Senator Bolden votes aye. <laughs> Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Mitchell votes aye. Senator Mitchell votes aye. Senator Seeberger votes aye. Senator Seeberger votes aye. Members, please vote. Members, oh, Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Housley votes no. Senator Housley votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Weber votes no. Senator Weber votes no. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Western votes no. And Senator Western votes no. Senator Anderson, are you planning to vote? Senator Pratt? 
All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 27 ayes and 37 noes. The A-5 amendment is not adopted. Mr. Members, President. any additional uh, amendments? Mr. President. Uh, Senator Johnson. Move to lay the bill on the table. And a roll call requested. Uh, that is a non-debatable motion. Uh, and did you request a roll call? Yes. Roll call requested a roll call granted. The secretary would take the roll on the motion to lay the bill on the table. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator Morrison, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Bolden votes no. Senator Bolden votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Mitchell votes no. Senator Mitchell votes no. Senator Seeberger votes no. Senator, Senator Seeberger votes no. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Coleman votes aye. Senator Coleman votes aye. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Housley votes aye. Senator Housley votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Weber votes aye. Senator Weber votes aye. Senator Westrom votes aye. And Senator Westrom votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Draskowski votes aye. Senator Draskowski votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 33 ayes and 34 noes. The motion to lay the bill on the table fails. Any additional um, um, amendments? Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Mr. President. I introduce the A2 amendment. Senator Hochschild offers the A2 amendment. The secretary will report the A2 amendment. Senator Hochschild moves to amend House File Number 100, the first unofficial engrossment, as follows. Page 294, line 32, delete 13,987,000 and insert. This is the A2 amendment. Senator Hochschild, to your A2 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. This amendment would appropriate 10 million in the first year and 5 million in the second year from the general fund for drug evaluation and classification program for drug recognition additional phlebotomists, drug recognition training for peace officers, as defined in Minnesota Statute 626.84. And I ask for a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Any additional discussions on the A2 amendment? Senator Nelson. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I did not hear where this additional $10 million is coming from. So, Senator from Hermantown. Where's the $10 million coming from? Our bills have to balance on the Senate floor here. Uh, Senator Nelson, I now assume that you're requesting through the president uh, whether uh, Senator Hochschild will yield. Are you asking if he will yield? Yes, Mr. President. Senator Hochschild, will you yield? He will yield. Did you hear the question, Senator Hochschild? He did. Senator Hochschild, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Nelson. This is a general fund appropriation. Senator uh, Nelson. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I'm just a little stunned that we're just having a general fund appropriation added in an amendment on the Senate floor. Um, perhaps uh, Senator Marty could yield and explain where that general fund $10 million has been hiding until today. Uh, Senator Marty is not on the floor. If you have a motion, Senator um, uh, uh, Nelson, I'll, ha I'll be happy to entertain it. Do you have a rule that you want to cite? Mr. President, yes, um, Senator I, Nelson? Will I will find the rule for you and we will cite it. This is unprecedented to have a $10 million uh, general fund expense show up in an amendment without being paid for. Let me find the rule, Mr. President. Uh, Senator uh, Port. 
Thank you, Mr. President and members. I encourage a yes vote on this. Uh, having talked with law enforcement and uh, Senator Hochschild, this is an additional investment in the uh, drug recognition officers uh, to help make sure that our roads are as safe as they can be. I encourage a yes vote. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Hochschild yield for a question? Senator Hochschild, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Housechild. <clears throat> um, I think I appreciate the, the amendment, what it's trying to accomplish. Looks like it's funding for drug evaluation experts and training, drug classification, police officer training, um, et cetera. And I'm just wondering why we might need to increase funding for police officers, drug evaluations, and drug recognition experts in regard to this bill. Senator Housechild, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Um, as we know, there is um, evaluations that are being studied and looked into when it comes to cannabis. Um, so this is in part helpful for that. This is also a direct appropriation to public safety professionals in addition to some of the local government aid that is provided in this bill to help with uh, bringing this new industry to our state. S Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Housechild. I think this amendment proves a very important topic of the debate we're going to have today, uh, which is the bill, admittedly, based on some of the conversation we've just had and based on the amendment being brought forward, is not ready. We just heard that evaluations are ongoing and that we need funding to continue more evaluations of cannabis, its effects on people, how it may impair their driving ability, and for police officers to determine whether or not somebody is impaired or inebriated if they're under the influence of marijuana. Furthermore, it was just acknowledged that public safety is gonna need more funding to actually do their job. Well, why in the world would public safety need more funding? Why would we need more funding for cannabis evaluation and drug experts if this bill isn't gonna have a negative impact on public safety, if this bill isn't gonna have a, neg a negative impact on traffic incidents and fatalities? If we know exactly what kind of impact cannabis is gonna have on people, why are we still passing funding in this amendment to evaluate it, to train law enforcement officers on how to detect it, funding for drug experts. Uh, folks, here's the deal. We can continue to try to make improvements on this bill and uh, continue the trajectory of the state of Minnesota making subtle uh, increases and changes to the legalization of cannabis in our state as we have over the years. But for those that would suggest that this bill is ready because it has been through however many committees are admitting with this amendment, if they vote for it, that it's not ready. There's still plenty of work to be done here. This isn't something that we should be rushing to. And it leads me to ask the question, are we passing good policy, or is this an attempt to pass what someone thinks is good politics, Mr. President? That's what's at issue here. And if we are saying that we need more money and funding for public safety and drug experts and evaluations, then that's a clear sign this bill is not ready to be rolled out statewide. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it does not appear that this is an omnibus bill, which is not limited to a set amount. So technically, uh, this bill, we could add any cost we want to uh, to this bill, which maybe we should think about doing. Uh, what I would say is that the, the items that are mentioned in the middle part of this amendment are things that have our law enforcement has been asking for for, for since the bill first made its appearance. And so it is rather shocking that uh, these have not been addressed, these things have not been addressed in all of the committees that it's gone through so far. And so while I, I definitely support the need for these things, the challenge is this bill is not ready. Why was this fundamental need to, um, talk about drug evaluation and classification, why was that not an essential part of 
legalizing uh, marijuana, additional phlebotomists, drug recognition training, and peace officers. We've been talking about that for, for months and months and months, and yet it shows up on the Senate floor as an amendment. And to make matters worse, members, do you know what? This is not just funded from the general fund. Read to the bottom of the amendment, members, and you will see that it is taking money out of the highway fund. The fund that we talked about yesterday, where we had so many needs uh, for safety. And now this, because this bill is not, it's premature, it has not been thought through, one of the main pieces uh, of essential things has been drug evaluation and rec drug recognition testing, and here it comes with not enough funding, and so we rob it out of the highway fund. Members, this bill is not baked yet. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, or Mr. President, and, and uh, Senator Hochschild. Um, again, a concern uh, as the lead on transportation. Uh, I know, Senator Newman, we've always talked about leakages, and, and we want our highway money going to roads and bridges. Uh, and this is concerning. I, I think it was in the bill already, uh, but I guess I'm, I'm a little bit confused on the A2. Does it take more money from the Trunk Highway Fund as the original bill does? Uh, so Senator Hochschild would answer that question or yield for a question. Is Senator Hochschild, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So, Senator Hochschild, does this take more money that was in the original bill from trunk highway funds? And can you explain uh, what the difference is? Uh, or is this just general fund? Senator Hochschild, to the question. If you need a couple more minutes, Senator Hochschild, or a second, are you okay? Uh, no, Mr. President, thank you. I can answer. Okay, Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Uh, this does take it from the general fund. Senator Jasinski. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Hochschild, for confirming that. Again, uh, uh, we already have enough money taken out of the Trunk Highway Fund, uh, so I, that is good to know that does not come more from there. But again, I, I think the question of the overall bill, uh, if this does pass, does this improve public safety in Minnesota? And I don't think there's anybody I've heard from from law enforcement that says this bill will improve our public safety. This is costing us more money in training and patrolling and testing and less money going towards our roads and bridges. So uh, I would vote no on this amendment. The last person to be heard, oh, uh, Senator uh, Kuhn. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Housechild yield? Would Senator Housechild yield? Oh, Senator Housechild, will you yield? He will yield. Uh, Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Housechild, I, I guess I'm confused by your answer. I'm just, if you could help us explain what lines 1.16 and 1.17 are in your amendment, what, what that means. That says that 6.157 million the first year and 2.218 million second year are from trunk highway funds. Um, so I, you say it's coming from the general fund. I guess if you could just help explain that for me. Senator Hochschild, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kroon. In the original bill from the general fund, that is the fund that it was appropriated to. So we're just adding it back in with an additional amount to that fund from the general fund. Senator Kroon. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I mean, I'm not going to go uh, through my whole speech that I did yesterday on Highway 65 and the importance of um, funds that we need for trunk highways to actually, actually improve trunk highways um, if this bill is diverting any money from the trunk highway fund to pay for this bill, then that would be very disappointing with so many needs, so many needs on our trunk highways right now, particularly in my district. The quality of life is being affected and we're diverting trunk highway funds from what we should be using it for, which is improving our trunk highways um, uh, to this. It's uh, very concerning. Thank you, Mr. President. Any additional uh, discussion before I go to the bill, excuse me, the amendment author? Senator, Senator Hostel, you have the last word on the A2 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I think we've talked about this uh, enough, so I just ask members to vote green. Thank you. The secretary will take the roll.
Members, please vote. Senator Morrison, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Bolden votes aye. Senator Bolden votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Mitchell votes aye. Senator Mitchell votes aye. Senator Seaberger votes aye. Senator Seaberger votes aye. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Housley votes no. Senator Housley votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Weber votes no. Senator Weber votes no. And Senator Western votes no. And Senator Western votes no. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 30 noes, the A2 amendment is adopted. Any additional amendments? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President. I have the A13 amendment. You have the what? A13 amendment. Senator Hoffman offers the A13 amendment. The secretary will report the A13 amendment. Senator Hoffman moves to amend House file number 100. The first unofficial engrossment as follows. Page 296, line 19, delete $4 million and insert. This is the A13 amendment. Senator Hoffman, if you'd be so kind as to talk about your A13 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I sure would. It uh, has to do with the 1994 Grammys. So, uh, Mr. Ch Mr. President and, and members, what you have is the conversation that we have in uh, this space. We had set aside money for prevention, treatment, and recovery. All this does is it moves instead of the $4 million, it turns that to $5,500,000, and then does one other line that moves that to $5,500,000. Addiction is addiction is addiction. And when you're setting something up, we wanted to make sure that there's a, a base in place. I sure hope the author takes this as a friendly amendment, and please vote yes. Senator, uh, Senator Port. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Hoffman, uh, looking at this, I know uh, your passion for this area, uh, and I appreciate your work on this. I am willing to accept this as friendly. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Hoffman yield for a question? Senator Hoffman, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Duckworth, and if you, you'd be so kind, Senator Duckworth, to bring that mic up. Senator Duckworth. Will do, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Hoffman. It's a friendly question. I just want to make sure I understand the amendment correctly. The amendment, does it call for an increased amount of funding for uh, treatment, prevention, and recovery? Senator Hoff uh, Hoffman, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President, and to the good senator from the southern part of the metro area, the answer is yes, but it doesn't take and move the target, so thank you. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Senator Hoffman. I greatly appreciate that, and uh, it goes without saying that there are a few in the Minnesota Senate that have such a commitment to helping those in need as it relates to things like prevention, treatment, and recovery, as Senator Hoffman. And again, I would just point out to the body what these amendments are telling us about the impact of passing this bill. If we are passing or adding amendments to the bill to increase funding for things like law enforcement, to increase funding for things like drug evaluation, if we're passing amendments to increase funding, like things for the prevention, treatment, and recovery of substance use or abuse, what does that tell us about the very bill that's before this body? We are continuing to counter every argument being brought forward to justify this bill with amendments from the very party that's seeking to push it through. I'm finding it hard to follow the logic because there are so many contradictions in the conversation and the debate we're having here today, which only goes to prove this is not ready for the people of Minnesota. Let's take the time to get this right, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for a roll call. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, I appreciate Senator Hoffman offering this amendment to give us a chance to talk about the impact that this bill is going to have on substance use disorder in the state of Minnesota. When we had this bill before the Senate Human Services Committee, one of the questions that we asked of uh, the Department of Human Services was as a part of their fiscal note, uh, which I believe was pending at the time, would they be analyzing the secondary effects that this bill would have on substance use disorder in the state of Minnesota? And their answer at the time was no. I don't think that answer has changed. And so again, this bill is before the body without a thorough analysis that's done on what the cost will be to the state of Minnesota, to local units of governments, and to families who will be facing substance use disorder. Um, and Mr. President and members, I think, and we'll talk about this perhaps later, this is going to be not just allowing cannabis dispensaries to be open, allowing retailers to be open, but the low potency licensure in this bill could be putting cannabis products on the menu at bars and restaurants. It could be putting cannabis products in our grocery stores and convenience stores and exposing uh, millions of Minnesotans to cannabis products who are not specifically seeking it out. And so I don't think this amendment is going to cover the increased cost in substance use disorder. And we don't even know what those costs will be because the work hasn't been done before bringing this bill to the floor today to understand the true cost that we'll have on the state of Minnesota. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, members. Prohibition does not mean that people aren't using cannabis. What it means is that people are using cannabis that is growing less safe, and people are getting hurt. When we regulate the use of cannabis by making it legal, the product will be safer. People will use it as they are now. And people who use it and need support because of substance abuse disorder will get that help. Making cannabis legal doesn't mean more people are going to use it or less people are going to use it. We know people are using it today. The Hoffman Amendment means there's more access to support. 
and that's important. But I think we have to open our eyes to the fundamental fact that people are using cannabis today. What we are doing with this legislation is legalizing it, regulating it, making it more safe, and getting people more help. So if we want people to be safe, this is the path. Thank you. Senator Grudenhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, thank you, Senator Hoffman, for bringing an increase in funding for the addiction. And I think it shows one of the fallacies of this bill. You know, um, having uh, done jail ministry for 13 years, I've seen a lot of addiction. And what addiction does, you lose the, the ability to make a decision on whether you want to use or have something. Uh, you have to have it. And you'll do almost anything, crime or otherwise, uh, in order to get it. And the more addiction we uh, promote, the, the more problems we get. I have a good friend who about 10 years ago uh, moved out to Colorado, where it is legal. And I talked to him about uh, two weeks ago about the consequences out there. Number one, they don't receive near enough revenue for all the uh, negative consequences that come out, out of legalization. In fact, he said uh, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about seven to eight to, to one negative, one dollar of tax revenue to seven to eight dollars of, of, uh, of negative consequences. Number two, if we look at homelessness, we know based on that, that a lot of those people are addicted to illegal drugs or, uh, uh, or having uh, drug type problems. You know, when I was in the, in the uh, when I did jail ministry, one of the things I usually ask the pres prisoners was, I said, how many of you were on excessive alcohol or illegal drugs or both when you got arrested? Uh, about 95% of them raised their hand, okay? So when you use mind-altering and emotion-altering drugs, it does have an effect, especially when you put it with addiction. I have to um, uh, uh, quote one thing from our Liberty Bell in Independence Hall here in, in the United States. The, um, the quote on the bell is, proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. What this bill does, it proclaims addiction and exploitation throughout the land. It's not ready for prime time. Even people who support legalization don't support this bill. It's got a lot of flaws. It should go back to committee and have major reworks. And we can see that by the number of mem amendments that come forward and where they're targeting this bill, which is, still leaves a lot to be desired. So members, I encourage you to vote green on this amendment by Senator Hoffman, but the bill itself is taking us in the wrong, wrong direction. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I do thank Senator Hoffman for thinking of this, but again, I want to respond to the Senator from St. Paul saying people are using it. Absolutely, yes, they are here in Minnesota. Uh, but this bill is just going to make it more accessible to our children, to more people. We're going to create more issues. And secondly, if you think the illegal market is going to go away because we're legalizing it, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that is not correct. Illegal activity, the cartels are not going to stop operating. They're going to continue to try and sell. Uh, it's going to happen. If you think legalizing this will stop that, it will not. Senator Hoffman is the author of the amendment. He gets the last word if he has anything else he wants to say. Senator Hoffman, he, he has no other words. Uh, the secretary would take the roll on the A13 amendment. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator Morrison, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Bolden votes aye. Senator Bolden votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Mitchell votes aye. Senator Mitchell votes aye. And Senator Seberger votes aye. Senator Seberger votes aye. Senator 
Members, please vote. And remember, you're not supposed to be at other members' desks talking. Senator Rasmussen, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Coleman votes aye. Senator Coleman votes aye. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Housley votes aye. Senator Housley votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Weber votes aye. Senator Weber votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Westrom votes aye. And Senator Westrom votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 65 ayes and one no. The A13 amendment is adopted. Any additional amendments? Senator Duckworth. Uh, Mr. President, I don't have an amendment. I'm just wondering if the uh, bill's author would yield for a question. Uh, Senator, oh, she will yield. Uh, Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank and, you, and members, if I can just remind you, it's kind of hard to hear up here. So if you're not talking directly in your mic, I have difficulty hearing you. So I'm sorry if I just keep reminding you of that by putting my hand up to my mouth. That's just to remind you. So thank you, Senator Duckworth. No, thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Senator Port. Um, you know, <clears throat> much of the discussion today, and I'm sure much of the discussion that occurred in committee had to do with looking at other states that had legalized cannabis, whether it varies from this bill, but in principle is somewhat similar, and trying to learn some lessons from what has happened in those states since uh, cannabis was legalized. And I know that that's obviously something that many of us are concerned about or may have questions about here in the state of Minnesota. What, what potentially would happen? So my question is this. Uh, I'm just curious if anywhere in the bill it calls for a study that would look at any increases or changes to things such as public safety and crime rates, traffic incidents and fatalities, use by minors and those under 21, any negative impacts on mental health and the impact the bill has on the illicit market. That's the question, Mr. President. Senator Port, are you ready? Senator Port, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President and Senator Duckworth. Uh, yes, if you look at page 250.1, it talks about a baseline survey that we are doing to understand uh, current levels so that through the studies that we do uh, as legalization progresses, we will learn uh, both about traffic, about usage. Uh, we are studying, planning to study underage usage now and after legalization so that we understand the impacts uh, through this process. There are multiple studies in this bill that do exactly that. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Port. I greatly appreciate that. Would she yield for one more question? Uh, Senator uh, uh, Port will yield. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President uh, and Senator Port. I greatly appreciate you having that in the bill. I think a baseline study of where we are and how this is going to impact the state and the citizens of our state is extremely important. The question I have is, does anywhere in the bill it say what will happen or how the results of said study will be utilized to impact or change laws? So really what I'm asking is, if we are finding very significant negative and detrimental impacts regarding public safety, regarding traffic and traffic fatalities, regarding the use, especially the use of minors or those under the age of 21, if we're seeing a sharp increase in mental health issues uh, as a result of this study, does that then, in a part of this bill, require us, require the legislature to make changes that would protect and safeguard our citizens? Thank you. 
Senator Port, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President and Senator Duckworth. I have sort of two answers to that question. Um, first, I'll say no, there aren't specified changes that we have to make based on results of a study that we don't know the, what the results will be because we don't know what the results will be. So we can't make responsible plans for how to potentially make those changes. However, those reports are required to be delivered to the legislature uh, for us to study and look at. They're also required to be delivered to the Office of Cannabis Management, uh, which has some rulemaking ability around the number of licenses, uh, around uh, requirements around potency uh, that the Office of Cannab Cannabis Management is allowed to make in reasonable ways based on science. Uh, and uh, safety. Um, so there are many opportunities. The, the numbers or the studies are sent back to both the Office of Cannabis Management and the legislature to ensure that we have the information. Uh, what we do with it after that, uh, Senator Duckworth, is up to us. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Port. I greatly appreciate it. And I couldn't agree with you more uh, with the very last thing you said. In the future, whoever that legislature happens to be, if we get the results of this study and they show that this maybe hasn't played out or had the impacts that we thought it might, if it shows negative impacts to things like public safety, traffic fatalities, use of minors, mental health, etc., I can only hope that then the legislature takes action to correct or modify or add some safety measures if that study shows and proves that they're necessary and required. Thank you. Senator Grudenhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. If Senator Port would yield for a question. Senator Port, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Grudenhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Port. Say, one of the contradictions when I read the summary here is that we're going to allow the advertisement of, uh, of legalized marijuana in our state. And yet, what seems to be a contradiction is when it comes to tobacco, we ban the advertisement of, uh, of tobacco products here in the state. So, you know, does that seem like a contradiction to, your, to you also, uh, Senator Port? Senator Port, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, there are significant uh, restrictions on advertising on, I'll find the page. Uh, there are significant restrictions on advertising, including uh, what the advertising can look at, look like. There's no television advertising required. Uh, it's much closer to how we, um, it's, it's much more restrictive to how we allow the advertisement of alcohol. Um, which is what we originally looked at. And it's on page 137, uh, Senator Grunhagen. We did put significant restrictions on them. And in fact, some of the loosening of those restrictions was in response to a member from uh, an amendment from your caucus uh, that I accepted. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Port, for that response. But it just seems to me we should uh, treat it like tobacco. You know, uh, again, I had that close friend out in Colorado, and he just says the smell of that marijuana smoking is uh, very difficult to uh, deal with for people who don't use and pe for, for people who don't smoke. Also, it's uh, a negative influence on our children. So, Senator Port, when you go to conference committee, if this were to pass, hopefully it doesn't, uh, I would just ask that you would restrict it to the same level that we uh, restrict tobacco products. Uh, at least that would give some type of measure of uh, help to the uh, citizens, citizenry in the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator uh, Kunis for a motion to recess. Thank you, Mr. Pre uh, President. I do request a recess. Um, to be returned upon the call of the president. To that motion, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The Senate is now in recess.
Senate Republicans will caucus in 323. Senator Kunash. Mr. President, I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the sergeant at arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. On that motion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. <laughs> further discussion on the bill. We are, we are back on House File 100. Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President. Is it appropriate to make comments to the bill, or do you want to wait for amendments to get done? No, it's not third reading. Let's do amendments, and then we'll go to third reading. Thank you, Mr. If you can put me on the list, that'd be great, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator, Ab Senator Abler, uh, Hang on. Mr. President. Senator Johnson. What's the question before the body? We are on House File 100 awaiting any further amendments. Are there no further amendments? The Secretary will give the bill its third reading. Pass file 100, a bill for an act relating to cannabis, establishing the Office of Cannabis Management. Third reading. Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I, uh, well, I'm trying just to maintain my composure. Um, there's a song, Who Do You Love? And uh, it was pretty famous in my time. Um, I probably remember part of it because I was under the influence of some other substances at the time, but I don't remember who sang it, but I remember the song. Um, Mr. President, a lot of us love a lot of people. Um, and I, I met a man, uh, I think, 18 months ago. Uh, his name was Jake. And actually, I've had... I've had his picture on the front of my laptop for well over a year. Um, his mother was giving a presentation to our Human Services Committee, and many of the members here on the floor were there at the time. And she was talking, and then she suddenly, uh, this picture of a young man popped up on the screen, and uh, like a handsome man, and uh, she said, that's Jake. And turns out uh, Jake had had a, a drug problem and was in substance treatment and had been successful. And then someone gave him a blue pill, which is not the same as marijuana. But someone gave him a blue pill, 
And that was the end of Jake. And we were so surprised to meet Jake in this way, and I'm sad I'll never get to meet him. Um, and so we dedicated ourselves on the Human Services Committee for, that, for a key part of that session to deal with the issues of substance abuse. And I wish I could have said, let's have no more Jakes. But I found myself unable to say that. So I said, well, how about if we have less Jakes? How about if we try to find a way to make sure that our programming is successful and working with the department? And that was always been a whole long time. And there's, um, we made some success. Today we're talking about legalizing marijuana um, as a recreational item. And, you know, it's, uh, there was a time if you admitted using some kind of drug, that would be bad for your career and all. But I used it a lot when I was in college. And we uh, went and so there was a movie called Reefer Madness, and we went and watched it and under the influence of that product. And we thought it was pretty funny, like, oh, don't, uh, you know, it was like just a, a joke. And then Cheech and Chong comes out up in smoke, and they fall out of the car, they're laughing, and the smoke comes out. And that's, and that's, just, that's just really funny. It's fun, it's great, it just makes you be creative. And yeah, sure. Um, Senator Port said, Minnesota is watching. She said, now is the time. And, but I want to, and for my district, Mr. President, if I were to vote for this, it would be popular. But Mr. President, I didn't come here to be popular, at least in this regard. I came here to be responsible. And, and so many of the people who think it's fun and who enjoy the movie and think that Reefer Madness was just a comedy, um, really don't know the background. And we've sat through a lot of the discussion in our committees about the background. And, and so we have a bill in front of us that says um, <laughs> there's no limit on potency, there's no limit on age, 21. Um, and not to worry, we're going to give educational programs. Mr. President, my college years were a little time ago, but I remember I will predict that the, that the posters that are going to be created to warn people about the perils of marijuana are going to be on the, on the wall of someone's dorm room, and you'll just laugh at it while you're stoned, enjoying legal marijuana uh, at potencies far higher than I experienced in my time. This is not your, I guess now your grandpa's or your parents' marijuana. This is really powerful. This is really dangerous. And Mr. President, um, well, you're a doctor. There, there is no end of evidence about the, the troubles with today's marijuana. There, and there's no rebuttal to the medical evidence that people, in fact, come to harm. There's no rebuttal to the fact that people, uh, um, study after study, study after study after study, uh, the MMA in the, in the uh, Tribune had an article, don't do it. Uh, study after study, that, that you can get anxiety. Oh, you know, a little paranoia, that, that's what we got. I didn't know you can get schizophrenia. You can get that with this stuff. We didn't have that back in my time. You can get psychosis. Mr. President, you know what psychosis is. Psychosis is when the synapses in your brain start to sort of fry. And that's not even meant to be a, a humorous pun. For a person who's 30 years old to go have marijuana, I would vote for that. But to allow a person who's 21 to have that, their synapses, Mr. President, according to the evidence that's unrebutted, those synapses don't get formed until you're 21. We've, we've talked about so many different circumstances that um, the 21-year-old uh, isn't quite ready to go. District Attorney Mary Moriarty didn't charge a 17-year-old with murder because his synapses were not fully formed. Like, holy cow. And so do we believe that the synapses are formed or that they are not? We met a mother in our committee, and I forgot her name, so I won't have to embarrass her, but she's here. She's made a, a, an effort to tour around all the committees saying, I love my son. And he was like Jake but she can't talk to him anymore. Do you know why, Mr. President? Because he's dead. He, he, he had a psychosis from all this very, very strong marijuana, which in this bill has no limit in, in the amount of potency. 
put a limit in, make it age 30. I might vote for it. Um, how do you feel about um, intimate partner violence, Mr. President? The studies say it happens. How do you feel about suicidality? We talked about just this last week why that was an issue. We passed the whole law trying to avoid suicidality and suicide. Well, Mr. President, this gives you that. This gives you that. And we, how do you care about fetal harm? Does that bother anybody? There's a whole group dedicated toward fetal alcohol syndrome, and some of those kids come out, never have a chance to live because of fetal alcohol. And it seems very likely, upon what I've read, that fetal cannabis is no better. I am really worried. And so, not to worry, Mr. President, in this bill, we just added more money for prevention and treatment. Great! Um, Mr. President, I, I met a person, I, I believe this young man had, uh, this uh, Alex fellow, or I mean Jake, had multiple treatment opportunities. I met a person who's been through treatment 13 times, and it didn't work. So how many times do you want to treat these folks for their psychosis and their suicidality um, to make it get better? I will guarantee you, Mr. President, at the end, and we put all the money you can into treatment, all those people affected by this will not be well. They will suffer, especially if they started this when they were in their teens, and they're going to because they're going to get this stuff. The same as when tobacco was older, there were 15 and 14 and 12-year-olds smoking tobacco. And if you think that I'm kidding, Mr. President, I am not. Mr. President, never before in my experience here have we passed a bill that we know is going to cause harm to a large group of people. Never before have we guaranteed a bill that's going to cause anxiety and schizophrenia and psychosis and intimate partner violence and suicidality and suicide and fetal harm in the name of, it's going to be fun. I want my chance to go smoke pot. Mr. President, this is a responsible body of the legislature. I don't understand where all the adults have gone in the room, but it's, that this is not a Cheech and Chong joke. This is real. And there are going to be people in this state, Mr. President's constituents of ours, who will be dead because of this bill passing. Oh, they won't get laced fentanyl with their marijuana. Okay, there's going to be way more marijuana on every corner, uh, one place per 10,000. In my town, they're going to have two in my town. Mr. President, this bill doesn't have to pass. No member here has to vote for this thing. And there's no one I know on my side of the aisle voting for this thing, which means everybody else is a swing vote. And so when that happens, look in the mirror and go like, holy crap. And so don't tell me when you see a picture of the next Jake that you feel bad about it. Because you could have stopped it. Mr. President, I urge members to vote no. Thank you. Senator Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And, and I was going to cover some of the health benefits, too, but Senator Abler so ably covered it. And uh, again, I got a whole list of peer-reviewed science, scientific studies over a number of years that confirm everything Senator Abler has uh, stated, especially on the mental illness and addiction. Again, we have no limits on the strength of the uh, marijuana that's in there. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is I have a constituent who originally supported legalized marijuana, and uh, for a number of reasons. Happened to be a farmer, uh, but then he had to go to a meeting, an ag meeting, down in New Orleans. When he was down there, after the meeting, him and uh, I think he said seven other uh, uh, meeting attendants went out to dinner in New Orleans, where they have legalized marijuana along with a number of other drugs. Well, when they got there, it was, it was dark, and uh, they went inside on the restaurant to order. Well, they were sitting around the table, and all of a sudden there was gunfire outside the restaurant. So all eight of them crawled under the table uh, that they were sitting around. 
And the waitress comes up and says to him, what are you hiding under the table for? And uh, they said, well, there's gunfire out there. And uh, they said, uh, did you call the police? And the waitress said, oh, don't worry. They're not going to shoot inside the restaurant. And if we call the police, they're not going to come anyway. So they asked the waitress, well, why aren't the police going to come? And they said, because if they come at night, they'll get shot at. So they only come during the day. Members, think about that. The waitress told the eight people from Minnesota that had attended an ag meeting that the gunshots, to not worry about them outside the restaurant, because they wouldn't shoot inside the restaurant. And the reason she didn't call the police, because they're not coming anyway, because it was dark. Uh, they only come during daylight. And if they come at night, they get shot at. So uh, when they left the restaurant, the taxi driver drove up onto the sidewalk. And they ran out of the restaurant and got in the, in the taxi to take them back to their hotel. The other thing he said is, there, there were literally dozens of people, some of them smoking marijuana, sitting along the sidewalk, and even at the entrance of the hotel that they went into. So that experience changed his mind. In fact, he said again to me, he said, I, I used to support legalizing marijuana. But he said after the, seeing the results of the crime and the, the people addicted to uh, marijuana, sitting on the street, and he said, and some of the other uh, consequences, I've changed my mind. I don't support it anymore. So members, so much of what we're doing here is the promotion of addiction. And you know, one of the things to remember, members, is that your health is a blessing, okay, from your creator that gave you life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And when you lose your health, you lose a lot of the... Uh, opportunities in life. And one of the things that takes your health away and even your property and your, uh, your money is addiction. Now we have, as a society since the 60s, legalized a lot of addictions, which we start exploiting each other. We used to protect our, our citizens from that. Now we've legalized it. And this is one more step on the pile in the wrong direction of, ad of addiction. And that addiction destroys people's health. It destroys their dental health, their physical health, their mental health. And as Senator Abler shared, it's well peer-reviewed science uh, studies show that it can be a total disaster, even death and suicidal thoughts from the, from the promotion of addiction. Again, you lose your ability to say no. You have to have it. And you will do almost anything, criminal and otherwise, in order to get the money to do it. And I could give you a number of examples, uh, even in my district, where this has happened. And uh, where they even, uh, you know, addicted uh, parents even stole from their children in order to, to, to uh, subsidize their habit. So members, the road we're going down on in this state, especially, is licentious freedom. That's not the freedom this country was founded on. Licentious freedom is self-indulgent and exploitive freedom. Anything goes, and if I happen to addict you to a product I'm selling, so be it. And that's the problem, members. This is one more uh, direction towards licentious freedom. Remember, we were founded on liberty based on the Judeo-Christian pr principles that taught respect and caring for our hello, he, fellow human being. This bill takes us in the wrong direction, and it especially is bad for our children because we know that, that this mentality will be going down into the children. And I've seen it a number of times. You say, well, they're doing it already. Well, you know, people steal already. Do we legalize stealing? People do violence against other people, uh, assault them. Do we legalize assault? No, we send the right message as responsible adults and as government. Members, 
in addition to what I just talked about as far as health, again, my friend in, in uh, Colorado, you're having the cartels move in. And not only do they undersell the, going pr the legal price, they, export, they grow and export their product to states where it's illegal, according to my friend. So rather than growing it in a foreign country and bringing it over here, now through legalization, we allow them to grow it and export it to illegal states here in the United States. And they're making millions. Okay, so we're, in, we're uh, enriching the criminal enterprises at the expense of lawful citizens. So in addition to the homelessness that, th that this will cause, more crime, and of course the more chaos that we promote in our society, then all of a sudden government comes along and wants to restrict our access to guns to, def to defend ourselves as law-abiding citizens. So sometimes if you look at just the behavior, it seems like we're trying to promote as much chaos through crime in order to justify taking away uh, law-abiding citizens' guns or putting restrictions on them. I'll leave you with this, members, and I certainly hope you will vote for, for what's best for our society, true liberty and freedom, and not licentious freedom. Uh, I'll leave you with the words of John Adams, one of our founding fathers and also president, I think it was the second, second or third president of the United States. Here's what, oh, he's the second. Uh, here's what he wrote. He said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Morality and virtue are the foundation of our republic and necessary for a free society. Members, you're taking us in a direction of bondage and addiction for our citizens and less freedom and uh, away from the constitutional republic and the liberties that we've enjoyed. Please vote red, or at the least, we should send this back to committee to be redone. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Senator, Senator Umu Verbaten. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to start by thanking Senator Port for all the work that she's done on this bill. It has just... Um, been a joy to work with her as a co-author along with Senator Murphy and Senator Putnam and Senator Bolton. And I also want to thank all of the members of this chamber who offered amendments and helped craft this bill, um, especially folks across the aisle. You've been a part of this and um, I hope that you'll will join us in, in uh, passing this bill today. But I really would boil this down to two things. We know that people have been consuming adult use cannabis in Minnesota, um, and though people are doing this at the same rates, black Minnesotans are five times more likely to be charged for offenses. This is a racial justice issue, and we have um, been talking to the folks who've been most impacted by this throughout crafting this legislation. One of the people that comes to mind is Jonathan from Minneapolis, who has talked about what cannabis prohibition has done um, in his life as a black American. It has had a pro profound effect in so many areas um, since he had his first marijuana conviction very young. It's impacted his ability to get employment and stable housing. It discouraged him from completing college because he knew a lot of employers wouldn't hire a felon in a career that he was pursuing. It was him being incarcerated because of a past marijuana conviction, which also has prohibited him from being around firearms. Um, and the consequences of incarceration are also very traumatizing. But now that cannabis is on the way to becoming legal, having those charges be expunged for him is gonna, it's gonna make the world of difference for people like Jonathan, um, for communities of color that have been hit the hardest, and it's really a step in the right direction to rebuild the damage that has been done by this prohibition. And people should know that these convictions have a long, lingering effect on people's lives, and this is what this bill is about. It's about righting those past wrongs. That is 
100% why I'm a co-author on this bill um, and why this is the right thing to do. So we, we owe this to the people who have been um, impacted the most by this prohibition. It's our communities of color. It's black Minnesotans. It's especially black men. We owe this to them. We can legalize this. We can regulate it. We can expunge um, because we have to and because it's a racial justice issue. I'm so proud to author this legislation. I really hope that you will all join me uh, in voting yes. Senator Uckey. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, this bill is wrong for Minnesota. All we, we don't need to experiment with this and see what the results might be. We just need to travel to some of the states that have done this prior to us. Um, I've been in Denver and I've been in Las Vegas in the last year. And I've actually uh, been there to witness this even early on. This is not good. What you see happening on their streets, what happens in their downtowns, um, it's not a welcoming environment for people to go for a walk. Uh, and this is during daylight hours, um, not even waiting for sundown. There's just nothing good that's going to come forward. I've had the chance to uh, make friends with a, f a couple legislators in Colorado. When they first got into this, they estimated that for every dollar of revenue, maybe five or six would go out in state additional costs. Those numbers have actually grown from original estimates to for every dollar of this so-called tax revenue that's coming in and all this money the state's going to make, that for every dollar coming in, 10, 11, and even more are going out in additional costs. Law enforcement costs increase, mental health, social service increases, crime is up, violent crime is up, and it just goes on and on. And a few of the, the numbers that I have found as I've done research with their numbers, and this isn't just taking somebody's opinion and reading a newspaper article. At the time I collected this, and it's been a couple years, it was off state data. The increase in murders and agri aggravated assaults at that point were up 35 and 25 percent respectively. Auto accidents were up. Crime was up 5 percent and that was by 2016 alone. So they'd only been, it had only been legal for less than two years. Serious violent crime up 12 and a half percent already at that time. Drug violations in the K-12 school systems, up 45% at that time. Social services costs, up, up, up. And this is a few years back. Those numbers haven't diminished. They've only continued to climb. We can do better than this. We do not need to legalize a gateway drug and create more problems out there. All, when we're, the whole time we're in session, we talk about the growing mental health needs and all the different substance use disorders, you name it. This is just gonna compound that and make it worse. So members, please vote no on this. Um, there is no upside, and from what I've found through research and what I see, everything is a downside. It's only gonna hurt us. Thank you. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I want to thank Senator Port for bringing this bill forward in such a thorough and thoughtful manner where she's taken, as she told us earlier, how many hours she spent listening and discussing and accepting amendments and making changes to address the concerns that are out there. And that's really important because we all know there are many challenges, and I think there are risks of cannabis use, as there are for alcohol has killed a lot more people. You don't overdose on cannabis, but alcohol and other drugs, they've been far more deadly, far more harmful. And making it a crime, prohibition as we've done here for so many decades, it just hasn't worked. People are using it. 
many for medical purposes, others for recreational purposes. You can like it or not like it, but it's a reality. And the reality is also that any harm that might be done by legalization is far, far outweighed by the harm that was caused by the racism behind this war on drugs. I believe Senator May Quaid earlier quoted the top Nixon advisor in the White House in the 1960s who acknowledged they lied about the drugs and lied about the war on drugs because that was the way they could get their attacks on people of different race. The shamefulness of that and the harm it's done for so many decades is one of the things I like about this bill. As my seatmate said, it's righting past wrongs. And being able to expunge the records of people whose lives were destroyed. I think we all have heard stories, Senator Ports one at the beginning today, of the woman whose whole life was destroyed because of our prohibition, because of the way we treated this. Her whole life was changed because of this. That alone should give us reason to change this. Whether people are using cannabis for medical purposes and it's a far safer chemical to use than opioids and other things, whatever their reason for using it, we're in the middle of a fentanyl epidemic now, and the biggest thing I hear from people when they hear somebody has purchased drugs, purchased cannabis, is the risk of dying from fentanyl poisoning. That alone is another good reason for passing this now, and with some urgency, so we can have a regulated market, so people can purchase the drug safely. I care very deeply about drug addiction, alcohol and tobacco and cannabis and other drugs. Alcohol is clearly the most dangerous of them, but a lot of other harmful drugs are out there. We got to treat these things not as crimes, but we got to treat them as health issues. And the way you start getting a handle on it is making them to be, in this case, a legal product that's well regulated. And I would not have wanted to I wouldn't envy in any way Senator Port for having to go through all those discussions for so many months, listening to people and trying to weave the way through to make a well-regulated system here, which she's working on. I'm honored to be able to support this bill today. I tried 20-some years ago for medical cannabis long before that was ready. This is something we need to do, and we need to do it now. We should have done it long ago, but we got to do it right, and Senator Port's bill does that. Thank you, Senator Port, and thank you to those voting in favor of this important, much-needed, urgent bill. Members, just as a gentle reminder, our list is growing, so I just want you to know that uh, uh, you can certainly make your arguments, but I would just, be, just give you a gentle reminder that there are your other colleagues that want to speak as well. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. And we've been hearing from some of my colleagues today that uh, Minnesota is ready to move forward to this bill. Um, but this bill, Mr. President, members, is not ready to be passed off the floor of the Senate today. Um, as was highlighted by some of my colleagues' amendments, we don't yet know the cost that this will have on local government. We don't yet know the secondary impacts that this will have on substance use disorder and other impacts and costs that it might have to the state. And another issue that I wanted to point out for the body is that this bill, in fact, encourages criminality. If someone were to go out and commit a drug crime tomorrow and become arrested for that drug crime, they will get bonus points under the application language in this system. That's something we talked about in committee, and it hasn't yet been fixed in the bill before the body today. So I want to talk about what a yes vote on this bill means today. It means that you're OK not knowing if there are sufficient funds in this bill to cover the cost uh, to local government. It means that you're OK not knowing what the cost that this will have on substance use disorder here in the state of Minnesota and if we have enough resources committed to it. 
Um, and it means that you're okay with having language in a bill that encourages and rewards criminal behavior here in the state of Minnesota. I also want to talk about something briefly because so much of the testimony that we heard in support of this bill was talking about uh, shortcomings with our medical cannabis program. I think there are many members in this body, myself included, who would be happy to work on reforms to the medical cannabis program to meet the needs of individuals who have a medical reason um, for using cannabis under the guidance of a healthcare provider. The answer to issues with the medical cannabis program isn't creating a recreational program uh, that has very few guardrails and many unanswered questions. And so especially to my Democrat colleagues here in the body today, um, I would just ask you to think about if this bill is ready to be passed or if you too perhaps have some unanswered questions. Maybe you want to see some changes to this bill. And I would just encourage you to consider voting no so that the conversation and the work on this bill can continue. This bill does not need to be passed this year. Um, this is a budget year. We could continue the conversation and make sure that if Minnesota is going to legalize recreational cannabis, that we do it in a smart way with all the information that we need to make a wise decision. And so I would encourage a no vote on the bill today. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Mohammed. Thank you, Mr. President. First, I want to take a moment and thank Senator Port for putting together a really good and a comprehensive bill. She's dedicated time and effort and worked with so many stakeholders to get this bill here. For, most, for a lot of people in this body, both sides of the aisle, this bill is about the fact that we could make a lot of money. It's good for our market. It's good for us to do this. But for some of us, it's about righting the wrongs that have been done to Minnesotans. And today we're taking a step, the right step forward, to right some of our past. This bill is about equity. It's about freedom. It's about justice. Members, for those of you who are, who I've had conversations with, who have said, I would consider voting for this bill, but just this part needs to be changed, and or those of you who have argued that this bill has not been vetted enough, we have not taken enough time to get it done, the people who are serving time, who have been serving time for decades, because we have locked them up for reasons that are not right, they don't have time. They should be welcome back in our society. And so I want to urge you, even if you have questions and you know that this is the right thing to do, I want to urge you to take the vote and continue working with Senator Port to get this done. Members, it's time that we legalize this, we regulate it, and we expunge people's records. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate it. Uh, I, too, uh, acknowledge that Senator Port has uh, done a lot of work as it relates to this bill, soliciting feedback, taking good faith questions. We may have had a Commerce Committee that lasted a little while as we tried to digest this bill and figure out what it meant and ways in which we can prove it. And uh, our thanks to a very patient chair of that committee for allowing me to ask many of those questions. And uh, I don't discount your arguments entirely. I think Senator Marty and Senator Muhammad, uh, Senator Amuver Baton, make some compelling arguments. They share some very compelling reasons as to why some folks might be in support of legalizing cannabis, whether it's solving some issues with our judicial system, whether it relates to expungement racial disparities, harm to minorities, or impacted communities. I think there is a bipartisan willingness to have those conversations and look at ways in which we can make the changes that many of us and many Minnesotans would agree are probably overdue. Things that maybe we didn't even realize 
were occurring over however many years and a willingness to right some of those wrongs. But I think we can do some of that work without completely going so far as what this bill does. And I say that um, coming from the perspective of, well, I guess I, I'm a fairly private person, but I'll share a little bit of my life story with you today. Uh, I'm actually uh, uh, legally adopted. Uh, my father, my biological father, is Hispanic. And he spent many years in prison for drug-related charges. So I know what it's like to be a little kid, uh, get a letter from a loved one who's in prison because of drug-related charges. Uh, and he wasn't my only relative that spent some time in jail or prison because of that. And so I respect your arguments. But the desire to legalize cannabis doesn't outweigh the safety of our kids. It does not trump our duty to public safety. And it does not justify contributing to the mental health crisis in our state. I'm not trying to uh, over-dramatize this. I'm not trying to be judgmental. For me, it's not about the money. It's not about the licensing requirements. We have a difference of opinion based on our unique perspectives. And I'll share just three quick perspectives that I have with you. I think everybody that comes to the legislature, one of the most powerful things you bring are your different life perspectives and experiences. I already shared one with you. But I have another perspective that weighs on me heavily when it comes to this argument, and that's the perspective of a parent. I've got three little kids, one, five, and seven. And for, um, for the, the leader of our state to say that they want to make Minnesota the best place to raise a kid, I have trouble squaring that with what we're considering with this bill. It's potential to be a gateway drug, the mental health issues it might bring about in our young kids, and some of the safety that they might deal with or that families might deal with on the roadways as a result of this bill. The other perspective I bring is the perspective of a veteran. I spent some time overseas in service of this country in Iraq and Kuwait from 2011 to 2012. And I had a platoon. I was a platoon leader at the time. And in the two to three years after we came back from that deployment, two of my soldiers had committed suicide. And their suicides were related to substance abuse. And almost a year ago, another one did. Three soldiers I served with overseas due to substance abuse took their lives. And I think this bill will only further exacerbate and encourage the use of a substance or the eventual use of other substances that will compound that mental health crisis at issue amongst not just veterans, but Minnesotans in general. Last but not least, the perspective of a first responder. I'm a volunteer firefighter in Lakeville. And I can't tell you how many calls I've been on, <clears throat> whether it's a traffic accident because somebody was under the influence of alcohol or cannabis and the lives that were lost as a result. I don't want to see an increased rate of that. <clears throat> the mental health crisis and issues it has caused in our youth, going on calls where you have to resuscitate somebody <clears throat> because they overdosed. <clears throat> and the conversations you have to have with their loved ones. Excuse me. Well, now I have to wrap up quickly. Last but not least, uh, it wasn't long ago that uh, we got a call <clears throat> and we, uh, with the fire department, had to go to the station. And it was interesting because I'm not very used to the police officers meeting us at the fire station, but in this instance they did. And it was about a month ago. And when we got to the station, I was very thrown off because the cops were there. And I realized they were there because they were going to escort us to a bridge on the interstate, on I-35. Because a young woman was on the bridge, prepared to jump and take her own life because she was suffering from mental health issues and in a crisis. And thankfully, we were able to respond. We got the ladder truck there in time. We got the ladder up to her. We pulled her down to safety. 
But here's what I can tell you. If we're going to pass a bill that's going to legalize and make much more prevalent a substance that has the known side effects of causing mental health issues with our youth and people in general, and we know it's going to lead to an increase in that, I struggle. I struggle with voting in favor of that and making that the law of the land here in the state of Minnesota. We had a bill before us not long ago at the beginning of the session, and I asked myself one question. I shared it with the body, and the question was, does this bill do more harm than good? And folks, as it relates to this bill, I think without question, it's going to do more harm than good. Thank you. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I can appreciate all the hard work that's gone into this amendment or this bill, but despite 15 committee hearings, this bill is so wrong for Minnesota. A few short years ago, we had a marijuana hearing in the Judiciary Committee in the Minnesota Senate. Uh, we had testifiers from different parts of the country talk about their experience when their state legalized recreational marijuana. The state of Colorado recognized that once it passed, traffic accidents were on the rise. For some, marijuana is recognized as a gateway drug, which leads people in, down a path of more illicit drugs, and eventually causing the death of very many people. Today's marijuana has a THC factor, I've been told by a number of different people, anywhere from 300 to 500 percent more THC than that that was created in the 1970s. It also is recognized that the work ethic declines in these states. And if you have an employer that's looking for good, responsible workers, once this passes, they may have an even more difficult time finding someone with a strong work ethic. There's also the suspicion that marriage dissolution and divorce continued to rise once marijuana, recreational marijuana, was passed and allowed in these states. And the discussion about how much money we can raise in taxes was also asked. For every $1 raised in taxes on recreational marijuana, it went anywhere from eight to $10 in expenses to cover the social service costs that that state had to pay out in new fees, recognizing the effect of marijuana and the growing illicit trade. Statutes that legalize rec recreational marijuana in those states is on record of attracting more illicit drug traffic in those states, especially with marijuana. Uh, the cartels use the legal standing of recreational marijuana to hide their wares, their products, in that same traffic flow. And can you imagine what the effect is going to be on our newly created medical marijuana industry that we just created in the state of Minnesota just a few short years ago this bill will utterly destroy that pure, well-governed, well-regulated product. Why would anyone want to go to a pharmaceutical-grade marijuana when they can go find it somewhere else in their neighborhood? A tremendous industry will be literally destroyed in the passage of this bill. Well, there's a lot of uh, discussion about substance disorders as well. You know, we have talked about 
the effect of brain development and how it affects young people. Uh, we've heard the discussion from even a number of both Democrat and Republicans on this floor of how we have to be careful when we impose criminal sentences on those who may not have the mental maturity to understand what they have done and what they've done to others. That applies in this case, too, with a 21-year uh, uh, factor rather than something a little older. Young people, the longer they are on uh, the effect of marijuana, are at a greater risk for long-time adverse impacts. More and more studies are concluding these negative impacts, more mental health problems. The Journal of Pediatrics uh, has warned us about that. The Minnesota Department of Health has found significant increase in cannabis poisoning. Uh, in this case, there's no potency requirements or limits in this bill. That should be a major concern for every mom and dad in the state of Minnesota, let alone the adult users. The Minnesota Medical Association, the Minnesota Psychiatric Association, the Minnesota Society of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry all are supportive of raising the age limit to 25 and putting a cap on the potency of marijuana, a potency limit that's not recognized in this bill. We also have the issue of local control. Cities under this bill cannot regulate the number of licenses. The cities cannot revoke a license like they can alcohol. Cities cannot charge a license fee equal to a liquor license, also a mood-changing uh, drug. The Minnesota League of Cities, Minnesota Association of Counties are opposed until adequate local control protections are in place. For those of you who think local control is an important factor in governing, this doesn't have it. Public safety, we've heard it more and more from law enforcement. They have a difficulty measuring impairment if someone is driving under this influence on the roads in Minnesota. That'll be a difficult challenge in order to use our enforcement policies to bring about responsible use of this product. There was an amendment to provide more money for drug recognition experts as this bill was developed. Uh, it's not nearly enough, folks. It is just not nearly enough. We are going to be opening a door that's going to be very difficult to close. And it's going to be very difficult to put the genie back in the bottle once this occurs. I'm very concerned about the boom expected in the illegal market. The LA Times, when they conducted this bill, quoted the immense scale of illegal cultivation, fed a glut that crashed wholesale prices last year, jeopardizing those in the licensed market Small-scale legal farmers unable to sell their crop have pushed toward financial ruin. Minnesota, I believe, is going to face that same factor. California failed to address the reality that decriminalizing a vast and highly profitable illegal industry would open the door to a global pool of organized criminals and opportunities. This bill also features the Cheech and Chong standard for personal home possession limits. It says it can have, any person can have eight plants at home. Now I've seen some of the videos of DEA raids. Some of these plants are eight and 10 feet tall. You can have eight of them. You can have a privacy fence made of these products in your backyard. Two ounces, just two ounces is equivalent to three joints. And you can possess up to, what is it, a one and a half pounds? 
One and a half pounds you can, you can hold. Well, one pound equals 454 grams. One and a half pounds equals 681 grams. Well, the bottom line is one pound equals 2,043 joints. That's the home possession limit that we are allowing in the homes of Minnesota. I'm really, I'm really quite amazed this is so wrong for Minnesota. And one final point, the effective date for legalization in some of these factors is August 1st of this year. The, the House chief author revealed in the testimony in the House that it will take the regulators that are expected to govern this new policy anywhere from 18 to 24 months to be up and running. That means there will be 18 months minimum of a wild market with no regulation. No regulation. I am very concerned about what we may do in the next few minutes in this Senate chamber. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I, uh, I will be voting yes uh, for this policy today, uh, a policy long time coming from my perspective and a policy that uh, for me contains my own evolution, uh, my own thinking from my youth to today. Uh, I came of age uh, when we were living with a slogan, just say no to drugs, which in my now adult life, I recognize as a slogan that was simple and catchy, but with significant unjust ramifications. It was also a time when we came up with the policy in the United States of three strikes and you're out, which wasn't just a slogan, but instead a policy that had and has horrific impacts and results that there are people still paying with their lives from that policy that was about crime and about drugs and punished in disparative ways uh, people of color. We were, I grew up in a time when we were told not to use drugs, but I grew up in a small community in Wisconsin that was almost all white. There was one person of color in my high school. And people freely used cannabis without fear. They used it without fear of any ramifications. Same thing happened when I went to college. Same sort of place. Mostly white people freely using cannabis without any fear of any sort of trouble. Um, not something that I used, but it was used a lot around me. And that is not the experience for people of color. It's still not the experience for people of color which is why I think this policy is so important. I think I said earlier, people use cannabis. They do, all over the state of Minnesota. This is not something new, but what we are doing is changing by legalizing it and regulating it and expunging it, getting rid of the disparate consequences for people of color. When I was newly elected, I got to watch more watch than do, Senator Dibble and then Representative Carly Moline bring the idea of medical cannabis to life here in the state of Minnesota. And what I learned through that process, though considered an illegal substance, that it is helping so many people with pain, with a variety of disorders, and it means that fewer people are using things like opioids, um, which we know are very addictive. And we've already heard people on the floor today talking about the impact that it's had on people's lives. That includes people in my family who, with an injury and the use of those substances, have found themselves addicted and have paid significant consequences because of that. 
Medical cannabis was an important step forward for us to understand the good and the positive of what we see possible with cannabis. But for me, the most important part of my evolution on this question comes from important conversations I had with young people, and in particular, a person named Kaje and a person named Aisha, who very, very patiently helped me to understand that in other communities, not mine, but particularly in communities of color, the ramifications of the policy that we have in place right now are very, very harmful and disparate. And that's not right. It's just not right. And I understand that there are people that disagree and some who are saying that we need to keep working on this and I think there are probably people in this chamber who would never ever vote for this. But prohibition and punishment, and punishment that punishes some in ways that are much more harsh than others, cannot be the policy of the state of Minnesota. And treating substance use with incarceration cannot be the policy of Minnesota. But it is, and we can change that. And we can make Minnesota a more just place if we legalize and we regulate so the substance is safer and we expunge those records, which is what we're doing today. And that makes Minnesota more just and that's why I'm voting yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, this is a bill I've wrestled with. On one hand, I believe adults should be able to make adult choices. And as has been said on the floor, we know Minnesotans are using cannabis across the state in various products today, whether they're smoking it or whether it's in edibles. Most of us in this chamber grew up when the attitude towards weed changed dramatically. I recall we debated Sunday liquor sales for almost 80 years. We debated medical cannabis for several sessions, as Senator Marty discussed. But I also understand that this bill has several flaws. Senator Hochschild's amendment that was passed reinforced that cities won't be able to fully limit the number of retail locations in their jurisdiction. Today, cities can limit or prohibit tobacco stores, vape stores, liquor stores. But adult use cannabis is so important, the state must preempt and must set a minimum number of licenses that they have to make available. Cities are required to have a minimum number of licenses, members. For cities like Shakopee and Prior Lake in my district, they must have at least two licenses. So what does that mean? That means Prior Lake must make available a license, one license for every 13,000 residents. Shakopee, one license for almost every 20,000 residents. But I also look at like a Bloomington. Bloomington as a city of the second class, about 90,000 people will have to make six licenses available. But if they were to become a city of the first class, they only have to have five licenses available. Grand Marais must make one license available, one for every 15 or 1,600 residents. While Minneapolis and St. Paul is one for every about 20,000. But what's more disturbing to me, and what should be disturbing to most of us who started our, our political careers at local government, is that we are preempting what local governments must do despite what the residents want. The state will subsidize the industry with advertising while advertising for other legal products is restricted or banned. We have $6 million a year of taxpayer money going to help people establish various locations 
uh, uh, across the state, start businesses and train employees. We have, lots of biz we have lots of programs for workforce development and to help disadvantaged communities start businesses. So why is the state giving special incentives for cannabis businesses? We're not giving $6 million a year to start daycares or senior care or grocery stores. Why are we subsidizing this particular industry. When Minnesotans, when working Minnesotans are injured in a car accident or at work, say using heavy machinery, we don't know if the person's high at the time of the incident. And members, as we've discussed, as, as uh, some of the amendments that came through before tried to recognize, as cities and counties have told us, there are unidentified expenses unfunded consequences that we've attempted to make changes to today, but it's just a guess. There's a request for a local impact study to empirically identify the responsibilities our local communities will have to take on and the impact of property, property on, on property taxes. And that study isn't back yet. In Finance Committee, we've guessed. Senator Marty thinks the expense is going to go down. Cities that I've worked with tell me that we've underestimated the expenses. Fact of the matter is we don't know until we get that local impact note. And yet, there's this reckless urgency to pass this bill. Even today, we spent $18 million on the floor without knowing how these new expenditures will impact the bottom line. We have roughly $100 million left on the bottom line. We spent a fifth of that here today. It's almost as if the proponents of this bill don't want the people of Minnesota to know the real costs. We've talked about the criminal aspects. We could expunge the sentences of people convicted from low-level crimes without rushing into the rest of this bill. I've heard in committee, this bill has been around for a long time and now is the time to pass it. It doesn't matter how long a bill's been around. It doesn't age like fine wine. And we shouldn't pass a bill before the issues have been addressed and until we have all the information. Uh, Mr. President, I make a motion that this bill be referred back to finance, and I request a roll call vote. Senator Pratt has made a motion to re-refer the bill, the bill to finance. That is the motion before the body. Any discussion on that motion? Mr. President, I impose a call of the Senate for the duration of the motion. The Senate is under call. Senator Port, for what reason, for what purpose do you rise, Senator Port? Oh, okay. No talking yet. In, uh, okay. The only person that can talk is the person who's getting ready to, to do something related to the motion. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I move further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the Sergeant at Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. Any further discussion on that motion? I'll say aye. All opposed say no. no. The motion prevails. Senator Pratt. Mr. Chair, or Mr. To, President. To the motion. We're on the motion to reconsider. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I think I've made my argument that we have, uh, we have 
I'm Take sorry, re-refer, not reconsider. I meant yes. to say re-refer. I understood what you meant, Mr. President. Mr. President, I think I've addressed it that we've spent additional money in this bill today without understanding what the impact of the bottom line is, and it should go back to finance so that finance, one, has all of the costs, and two, so the finance committee can wait for the local impact note to assure that we understand all the costs. That's the role of the finance committee, and it should be adhered to. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I ask for a no vote on this uh, referral. Uh, this bill has been thoroughly vetted in 15 committee stops, including one in finance where we added the appropriations. Um, also, Mr. President, can I ask for a roll call? Roll call requested, roll call granted. Uh, um, members, this, this bill has been thoroughly vetted, uh, has gone through the process, and while I believe those of us in this chamber are ready to move forward with the vote, Minnesotans are ready for us to move forward. They have made it clear that they are ready for this bill. Uh, though this bill has not been heard in this chamber previously, it has existed around this legislature for six years. Um, and we should vote on this bill today. I ask for a no vote to re-refer to finance. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, this bill had 15 committee stops, and yet we were making significant amendments even here yet today, which shows the bill is not ready to be passed. We added almost $20 million in new spending today. It should go back to the Finance Committee members. I encourage a yes vote. Senator Pratt uh, moved that House File uh, Number 100 be re-referred to the Committee on Finance. A roll call has been requested and a roll call granted. The secretary would take the roll. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator Morrison, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Bolden votes no. Senator Bolden votes no. Senator Mitchell votes no. Senator Mitchell votes no. Senator Seeberger votes no. Senator Seeberger votes no. Senator Wicklund votes no. Senator Wicklund votes no. Senator Housechild votes no. Senator Housechild votes no. And Mr. President, Senator Friends votes no. And Senator Friends votes no. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Coleman votes aye. Senator Coleman votes aye. Senator Drayheim votes aye. Senator Drayheim votes aye. Senator Draskowski votes aye. Senator Draskowski votes aye. Senator Grunhagen votes aye. Sen Senator Grunhagen votes aye. Senator Housley votes aye. Senator Housley votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Weber votes aye. Senator Weber votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Westrom votes aye. And Senator Westrom votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote. The secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 nays, the motion to re-refer is, is, does not prevail. <laughs> Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, Senator Marty had talked about how much uh, time has been spent uh, getting all the players together, talking to all the different folks that wanted to talk about this. And, and I, I fully agree that Senator Port has put an awful lot of time into this bill, and I'm sure that Senator Port has talked to an awful lot of the different people about uh, getting this bill put together. One thing that kind of surprised me is that uh, when we just had the motion to re-refer, that Senator Port stated this has been through 15 committees and thoroughly vetted, and so it was ready for real time. And that really concerns me and really bothers me because... Uh, when this bill was heard in Commerce, one of the things I brought up was a lot of the issues that law enforcement is going to have in order to handle this bill if this bill is passed before those things are taken care of. 
I just rec I've been receiving several emails in the last week from various law enforcement groups in my district, and I just wanted to go over one of them that uh, was sent to me here just within the last few days from the sheriff of one of our local counties. And they're really quite concerned about this bill being passed, and the reason they are is because, like they state, there are no roadside tests to test the impairment of drivers. And they feel that's a real concern, and I can certainly understand that. Another concern they have is the time and the dollars that it's going to cost to train their law enforcement on the drug recognition, to be drug recognition experts. They're also very concerned because several of the states that have already legalized marijuana are finding that after the legalization and the legislation was passed, that traffic accidents and tra traffic fatalities have gone up. They're also concerned about young children and what types of forms of marijuana they may find inside their residences. And they're very concerned about the lack of local control in this bill. There's a lot of other things that they cited and are concerned about, but as the sheriff stated, he really feels that we have to have a thorough evaluation and get a lot of these issues corrected before we move legislation on. And I really think that, and I really agree with them, and I really think that that is an issue that we need to be looking at before this bill gets its final approval. Another thing that was quite surprising to me today, within a matter of minutes, we added $20 million to the bottom line to spend on the legalization of marijuana. It surprises me and it disappoints me. And the reason I say it surprises me and disappoints me is I remember less than a week ago, I had an amendment that would bring more money into the nursing homes. That amendment was debated for almost an hour, and that amendment was voted down. And it just shows me the misguided priorities of the Democrats when we can put 20 million additional dollars into passing the marijuana bill and yet pay no attention to our nursing homes. Another thing I seem to see going on this session and it seems to uh, be more and more prevalent. And that is the, the philosophy by the Democrats that you can't fight crime by punishing the criminals. And I do not agree with that. I think you fight crime by punishing criminals. So with that said, members, I'm going to encourage a red vote. And let's make sure we got this bill ready for big time before we put it out, of, out there. This is going to be a major cost to society. We have some important questions that are not being answered. And it's obvious that we're not looking for the answers. Because the stuff with the plea of the law enforcement was brought up when this bill first came to one of its first committee stops in commerce. And as we heard today, the bill has been thoroughly vetted, been in front of 15 committees, and it's all set to go. So if it's all set to go, it tells me that we're really not concerned about law enforcement and about this is how this is going to be taken care of. So members, please vote red. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Well, we, we've had a long debate and discussion on legalizing recreational marijuana today. There's a few facts that I think, salient facts, that must be recorded in the record. And I heard from a number of constituents who, who thought we should legalize recreational adult use marijuana. And I read their emails carefully. But there was not a salient point in those emails. Some talked about the value of marijuana for medical conditions. Well, folks, that's already legal in our state. In fact, as has been said, we have spent millions of state dollars to stand up that medical marijuana industry, which could be in peril 
uh, with the passage of now the recreational marijuana indus industry. In addition, uh, some, some of those emails talked about, well, we will bring in taxes, tax money for the state of Minnesota. Well, you look, need to look no further than, well, our budget to know we have uh, a $19 billion surplus. But most importantly, look to what other states have happened, what has happened to other states have, who have legalized adult use recreational marijuana. Look to Colorado. For example, the costs associated with recreational marijuana have exceeded, have exceeded the taxes they bring in, not just double, three times, four to one. The costs have far exceeded any tax revenue for legalized adult recreational marijuana. And then let, 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 let's talk about the fact that marijuana remains today a Schedule I drug at the federal level. We heard discussion on the floor today about uh, concerns that some of those decisions were not correct. Some may have been made with racial prejudices in mind. I can't undo the past. I don't know what was said then, but I can tell you this. Marijuana remains a Schedule I drug and all of the consequences with that. One of those means that if this bill passes today, if the governor signs adult use recreational marijuana, it will be an all cash business. Banks cannot lend. An all cash business. And that's one of the reasons why you see big portions of the bill that are using taxpayer dollars, public dollars, to stand up this new recreational marijuana industry because the banks will not be there to do that. I do not think it is at all proper for state taxpayer dollars be, to be used to prop up an addiction for profit industry. We talk on this Senate floor often about the harms of addiction, whether it be tobacco or whether it be alcohol. And we talk often on this Senate floor about the concerns of the uptick and the increase in mental health concerns and substance, substance use disorders, and particularly how those have increased post COVID lockdowns. And now here we are today debating on this floor if we should stand up, stand up, finance with state taxpayer dollars an addiction for profit industry that has only shown in other states to cause more traffic accidents. In fact, according to the National Institutes of Health, traffic deaths involving marijuana impaired drivers increased 138% and for all drivers, 29% since marijuana was legalized in Colorado. And as you have heard, one of the problems that we have heard over and over and over from our public safety officials is there is no test to determine impairment folks, to determine impairment for cannabis. That poses a major traffic and safety pattern on our highways. Apparently, the bill's supporters might have realized that because there was money in the bill to develop a test to see if there's impairment. But quite frankly, we need to have that impairment test first before we start legalizing recreational um, adult marijuana. We have seen that uh, more impaired drivers on the road uh, without a roadside testing um, already in those states that have legalized and with, with more to come. 
One of the other things that we had a debate on the floor about today was, in fact, we had amendments about it. In fact, over $10 million of money coming in on the Senate floor to add to this bill, which very rarely happens. These things are usually figured out in committee and part of, and part of global targets. So uh, there was some recognition that there are some problems with this bill in that it doesn't fund the local entities that are going to be faced with the consequences and the, um, and, and the regulation of this new uh, addiction for profit industry. It is concerning that these issues have not been addressed. I'm concerned that we are not looking at our future. You know, I have been a long uh, advocate for a long time in this body, protecting children from addictive substances, whether they be to tobacco, alcohol, vapes, and now we are on the verge of legalizing adult use cannabis for recreational use. Uh, members, this bill is not ready. It might be at another time, but there are way too many questions now about public safety, about local control, the lack thereof, and then also about our youth, health, and uh, just a couple of the health statistics that were not mentioned today. Marijuana is associated with a six-fold risk, increased risk of suicide. Over 30, 000, in a groundbreaking study of over 30,000 Americans, it showed that participants who reported marijuana use in the previous year were, were 2.6 times more likely to abuse prescription medications. This is an addictive substance. I'm vastly concerned that we are not addressing it properly on this Senate floor, and I would encourage a no vote. Senator McWaite. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I want to say something I say so often on the floor, which is I want to ground us in some reality. Um, we know from states like, we're not blazing a trail here in Minnesota, okay? We're going to be 23rd out of the United States to legalize adult use cannabis. So we have a lot of case studies to look at. And we know that in states that have legalized cannabis, it doesn't affect crime rates. They don't go up, they don't go down. They're just pretty much the same. It's had no effect on traffic accidents or fatalities. We do know that it has created a lot of jobs. In fact, my nephew, Mr. President, is one of those job holders in the great state of Colorado, which, uh, contrary to some other things we've heard on the floor, hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, and we know that legalization of cannabis has brought in money and revenue for states. That's not really the primary driver for my support for this bill, Mr. President. In addition to knowing that Minnesotans use cannabis, but right now, they purchase on the illicit market or in other states where it's legalized. And when we legalize it and regulate it, we make sure that it is safe. We make it way harder for young people to access it. Way harder for young people to access it. But really, there was a question asked earlier, Mr. President, that does this bill do more harm than good? The harm? on the prohibition, the harm to communities, particularly communities of color, has been immense. I said this quote earlier, but I just want to read it again. This is the domestic policy advisor of President Richard Nixon. We knew that we couldn't make it illegal to be against the war or to be black, but we wanted to get the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with drugs and then criminalize both heavily so we could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night after night on the news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. And here's the thing, Mr. President, about vilifying a group of people on the news and perpetuating myths is that they permeate into the culture. I'm a dare kid. I'm a millennial. I'm an elder millennial. So I did a lot of dare. And they teach you in dare, if you use cannabis, you will use heroin and you will die. I mean, that's literally what they said. And we heard some of that today on the floor. We heard myths like that, or that 
People who use cannabis are lazy. That's not true either. We know, because we have it in almost half of the other states in our country, the effects of legalization of cannabis, which is adults use it, kids use it less because it's harder for them to get, it's safer, traffic doesn't change, crime doesn't change, jobs are created. That's the reality that we're about to enter into. But we are also gonna fix the immense harm that the war on drugs has perpetuated, particularly against black men. Because when we talk about the vilifying night after night after night on the news, that led to incredible policing and over-policing of communities, the arrests and removal of fathers and mothers from their communities, incarceration where corporations made money off the incarceration of those people, charging them money to call their kids or get ramen packets out of the commissary, big money in criminalizing black people there. We know that in states that have legalized adult use cannabis that there have been a reductions in rates of opioid overdose and opioid related hospitalizations. When we talk about the enforcement of the prohibition on cannabis, when we make it not a crime anymore for adults to use cannabis, the enforcement related costs go down. The safety of our kids increases. We get to fix the harm. So, Mr. President, I think this legislation is going to be a real hit with Minnesotans. I really do. It's time for us to stop bogarting on this issue, weed out these outdated laws, and I'm going to be blunt, the reason why we need to pass this legislation is because Minnesotans are adults, and we trust them to make responsible choices with their lives. I am so grateful to Senator Port for all of the work that she has put into this bill, Senator Umu Verbaten, Senator Putnam, Senator Murphy, Senator Bolden. This piece of legislation represents an immense step forward in the personal trust and freedom of Minnesotans and repairing the immense harm that has been done to so many. Thank you. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. I've listened to the discussion here on the floor today and uh, I just need to bring up a couple things that uh, need to be corrected and a couple things that haven't been said yet. And I'm going to start out with the things that haven't been said yet. And for one thing, in this bill, in multiple places, Mr. President, there is reference to the fact that uh, we have to put more training in to prevent the harm that, that the policies in this bill are going to cause. So if you, if you know... You obviously know that it's going to cause a problem or you wouldn't have to put language in that says, here's how we're going to correct the, correct the problems that are going to arise. And I hope people know that. There's language in this bill that uh, mentions daycares, how daycares are going to have to uh, tell people. And this is a good thing. They're going to have to tell people if they're users of marijuana. Yeah, I, I would really, really like to know if the people that are taking care of the kids are using marijuana. That'd be a good thing to know, so thanks for putting that in. But it does also clarify the fact that there's knowledge out there that says we know that this, is, that this can be dangerous. The other thing that I've recognized in this bill that no one has brought up yet is the fact that in this bill, it specifically says... There's a group of people that can't be held uh, responsible and or liable ci or civilly or criminally for the effects that might come about because of this bill. One of them is the Cannab Cannabis Advisory Council and their members, the governor, the agency employees. None of these people are going to be held responsible for the things that are going to happen. And if they're so sure that this is not going to cause any problems, why do they have to put the disclaimers in? It doesn't make sense. I got a message uh, earlier today. We have uh, we had heard from uh, Senator Abler about a young man who uh, who died, and I got a message through the grapevine from that young man's mother, and she wanted us to know here on the floor that you can talk all you want about expungement of the people that have committed crimes. But the good thing about those is that you can go talk to those people. Her son, you shall never talk to him again. These things are real. 
And the last couple things I want to say is the fact, or the, the rhetoric that I've been hearing from the other side does not match up with the facts, not even a little bit. And one thing I want to dispute that I've heard over here again and again, and I hope the minority communities are listening to this, the references being made in this bill make it sound like if you can't have cannabis, somehow or another you're being discriminated against. That is just nonsense. I'm going to take you to my, my home where I live and the small community that has five overdoses a week, and that's just the ones they count anymore that make it to the emergency room because they, they, and they figure it's way more because of the Narcan pens. And so, and, and so I hope that you're listening out there because this thing is likely going to pass here today. The governor will gladly sign it. And the people at home in the communities are going to have to put a tight rein on what's going on because their families are going to suffer from this. Absolutely. This is a gateway drug. I've been around a long time on this earth and I can tell you I've seen this. I've seen it from the time I was a boy when the, when the, when the levels were small up to today. And it does destroy lives, and it does affect brain, brain growth. Don't let, don't let this fool you out there that this is somehow some kind of wonderful only medical procedure that, that goes on with this, and that it's not going to harm anybody. It harms people every day. And people do die from it. Maybe not directly, maybe directly. But the results of, of the use of this drug are immense. And so, Mr. President, members, I'm, I'm hoping that there will not be enough votes on that board today to pass this crazy bill. And, uh, and let's do some more, some more talk. Let's get out to the communities. And instead of, instead of doing what this bill does, which is not just legalize marijuana, this bill promotes marijuana. It gives grants to make sure that it goes into low-income communities. That in itself is a racist thing. How could you do that? I don't want it in my community. Vote red. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Members, again, we've had some great discussion. Uh, I want to thank Senator Abler and Senator Duckworth for sharing a little bit of their background, and, and I think it's probably fair that I do the same. So I was affected by marijuana, like Senator Abler back in the day in college, high school, into college. I started using it. Um, I worked a lot through high school. My first job is in third grade, picking up golf balls in the golf course. I put money away. I wanted to go to college. I put money away through high school. When I was a senior in high school, I was the dairy manager at the local uh, grocery store. I'd go in before I went to school. I'd stock shelves. Then I'd go to school. When I was done with school, I'd go back as the dairy manager, and I'd order the products that had been sold that day, so the next day, I could go back in again and get another truck and do the same. I worked all through high school, saved up money, went to the University of Minnesota, Duluth. Started using marijuana, and I did get lazy. It does happen. It doesn't happen to everybody, but it does to people. Some people it does, some people it doesn't. So I went through college, my grades got worse, I spent more of my money, my savings, I worked hard for so that I could go to college. Back in 1984, they didn't have free college programs trying to give away free college. I had to work for it. So because of what I did and how I almost wrecked my life, I made a decision to go in the United States Navy. And in the Navy, I learned what leadership was about. I learned about working hard, serving your country, earning your time, doing your time for the country, and making enough money to finish college. When I left UMD, my grade point average was bad. C, maybe a C minus. I did four years in the Navy, two, year, two tours overseas in the Persian Gulf, learned a lot about people. And I got out, and I finished my college degree with almost straight A's, because I was back on track. Drugs were not involved. So folks, it does impact people. And I'm sure I'm only one of a million examples of how it negatively affect. Luckily, I was smart enough to get out of that cycle. 
And folks, if I wasn't in the United States Navy, I would not be here today. It taught me how to do that. So that is my background. So I do have experience with it. So I've been in the committees, we've been through state government, we've been through transportation, I've listened to a lot of discussion, and I've been back and forth. I, I think we've all heard in our communities, we have people come to us, they're for it or they're against it. I got a text from one gentleman today, we have a, a group of about 13 gentlemen, business people that go to lunch every Friday. Well, lately we haven't been going to Friday lunches because we've been here. But one of my text strings is I'm not here, and it won't be at lunch today because I'm at, on the Senate floor debating the marijuana bill or the pot bill. And the text string blew up. Lots of comments back and forth. And one of the gentlemen on that text string said, if they think I'm gonna buy it legally, they're crazy. I'm gonna buy it who I've been buying it through for all the years. So if you folks think this is gonna make it, make the uh, other, other suppliers go away, you're wrong, and I've said that earlier. So let's get back to the point. So you know my history, you know I've been involved with it, and I have people on both sides. But we have to do what's right for Minnesota here. So I've listened through our committees. I have some points I wanna talk about. First point, do you think, members, this is going to improve the public safety in Minnesota? Do you really think this is going to improve our public safety here in Minnesota? I think not. Senator Carlson's been heavily involved in zero, zero deaths, and I can't believe that you can believe this is going to improve public safety in Minnesota. I can't believe that you can. Second, testing. We've heard time and time again, there's no roadside tests. And I'll get personal again, because you all know about it, it's been every newspaper the paper in the, in the state. I got pulled over a couple years for alcohol-related offense. I tested a .09. So folks, I was one beer over. One beer too many, and I've always been very careful about it. There's a weight scale and how many drinks you can have per hour and what your weight is, and you can go through that, and you can kind of see where you're at. So I was a .09, one beer over. What happens with testing with marijuana? How are they gonna know what that percentage is? They don't have the test for it yet. And yet the effective date of this bill is gonna go into effect before we have that? It amazes me. Think of the issues that's gonna bring up in court. Were you legal or were you illegal? Well, the police officer you know, thought you probably weren't. It's gonna make it difficult. Just one more of the issues. Training our local law enforcement officials, the cost. There's no estimate in this bill what it's gonna put on our local law enforcement agencies for training, for all those things. I brought up at one committee and talked about police dogs, the, the issue there, and the press took off and thought that was real funny about that was the big issue. That's not one of the big issues. It's an A issue, but it's not the big issue. A lot of drug dogs across the state that they've spent dollars on training, things like that, that now will go by the wayside. Again, the fiscal note. We don't know what this is gonna do our local entities. I talked to Sheriff Jesse Thomas, the Rice County Sheriff, and it scares him to the amount of money that's gonna cost that one local law enforcement agency to spend on training and all the types of things involved with what this bill will do. Next, let's talk about the social and the economic costs for our kids. This will make it more acceptable for our children to use, no doubt. And I don't think there's one person here that can disagree with that. It's gonna be, make it more accessible, more acceptable, because it's legal. We deter away from things that are illegal, at least that's the way I was raised. And if you make it legal, it's gonna be more accessible to our kids. I've talked to Superintendent Jeff Elstad from Otana, superintendent there. It's a huge issue already in our schools. The vape pens, the things like that, they're, they're hiding, they're using in school. It's only gonna get worse. It is only gonna get worse. Mass transit ridership. Again, we've been doing studies, COVID, pre-COVID, after COVID, what's happening on our transit. Folks, people from my district don't do it often, but when they do come up here, if they ride the transit, they're not gonna wanna be around that if there's legalized smoking of marijuana in, the, in those rail cars. 
Next, I've been in the legislature for seven years. The biggest thing I hear across the state, mental health crisis. Mental health, we go on, on bonding tours, we hear about mental health, mental health facilities. No matter what you talk about, mental health crisis. By passing this, it's not gonna help our mental health crisis in Minnesota. The expungement issue concerns me as well. So you're going to expunge people for committing a crime that was a crime when they did it. Makes no sense to me. Maybe it does to somebody else, it doesn't to me. Folks, there's not one law enforcement official that has come out and spoken in favor of this. Not one. In committee, I said, if you do want to talk to me that you're in favor, call me. Not one call. We have not got one law enforcement official that supports this bill. Driver safety, we've talked about what that's going to do for our driver safety across the state. No local control. So again, I started my career, uh, a life I should say, in, in boards and commissions on the planning commission, city council, mayor. We don't have any local control for our local governments and our city councils to say where it can be and can't be located, things like that, zoning. No local control of what's going on. Let's talk about workforce issues. Who's had a shortage on something, either workforce or something, because of workforce? Think of our truck drivers, our equipment operators, people uh, running large manufacturing equipment if this goes through. And now marijuana, recreational marijuana is legal. Are they still going to want to work all the time or can they now do this and not have to worry about it? Will it take them out of the workforce? I think it will. Just today, noticed in the, in the one bill earlier, but we're, we're taking money from our roads and bridges, from our highway fund, trunk highway funds, we're taking money away from roads and bridges and putting it towards the recreational marijuana bill that you have in front of you today. Shocks me. $8.4 million out of the trunk highway fund going to support recreational marijuana. Makes no sense to me. We've talked about the illegal or illicit or the cartel uh, trafficking going away. Folks, <laughs> I don't know what color the sky is in your world, but that's not gonna happen. They're not gonna shut up shop and go away. It's a business for them. It's still gonna be there. It's still stunning to me that what it shows to here today by the Democrat majority because they don't support our law enforcement. Because every vote today is against law enforcement because not one single law enforcement agency supports this bill. Not one. Senator Limmer mentioned, once we do this, we won't be able to go backwards. When you pass this bill today and the governor signs it, which he's promised he wants to do that, we're not going backwards. So all the problems is this is going to create is on the Democrat majority here in Minnesota. The one party control, the one party rule here in Minnesota is making this change. It's no secret it's going to pass 34-33. And for those on Twitter thought I was high-fiving because of that and I had my green, green tie on, first of all, the green tie was a mistake. I forgot about it. And I changed it. And the high-five was for something completely different with Senator Port. And I respect Senator Port. She's done a good job on the bill. I still don't think it's right for Minnesota. But she has worked hard, so I will give her that. And that was the high-five. So she's done hard work, and I wanted to give her that privilege to say that, too. Again, again we don't agree on this, but I respect the other members for doing this. I think it's gonna be a tough vote for Senator Carlson and Senator Healthchild and Senator Seberger and others. I think this is gonna be a tough vote for you. I really do. I think if this bill passes today in Minnesota, Minnesota is gonna go up in smoke. Senator Johnson. She's last. She's the author of the bill. Senator Johnson. 
Well, thank you, Mr. President. And members, we're getting down there. I'd just like to thank you all for the very robust debate that we've had today. Legalizing and decriminalizing marijuana is an enormous change for our state. We should have deep discussions about this. We've had part of that today. But this means a lot to our communities and to our state. Look, we know that there's an issue out there regarding legalizing cannabis. This isn't a partisan issue. We have a lot of Republicans. We've got a lot of Democrats that talk about this particular issue. And we've got people within our base that, that want solutions on this. And we're not denying that. But what we are saying is that we can't treat cannabis the same as what we're treating alcohol and tobacco. We can't just say license, regulate, and tax it. We've got to have a robust program that does that. We could have gone through the bill today as a Republican caucus and given amendment after amendment on ways that we can fix this bill. We would have been here all through the night into tomorrow working on the issues that we see throughout this bill. But the reality is, why waste our time on this bill when it needs to go back and get reevaluated to become something that all Minnesotans can get behind? What you're going to see today in the Senate is a very, very partisan bill. Folks, this is not ready for prime time. This bill needs a lot of work. Now, I, I recognize the work that Senator Port has done, and she's worked with members in our caucus, and I really appreciate that. That's how legislating should be done. However, there's a big push to get this done right now. We have new members that have never seen this bill before this year because they're just coming to the legislature. So to say it's been floating around for six years, that doesn't mean that everybody's had the opportunity to have an impact on the language of this and how it's impacting their communities, how it's impacting their families. There are five real big points that, that I have with this bill in particular. Uh, a number of members have brought up parts of them as well, but the public safety aspect, the local control, protecting our kids, substance use disorders, the complexity, the complexity within this bill. Those are a number of the big issues that we have. You know, if we talk about public safety, there's a lack of reliable testing. That's been brought up. Can you imagine you're out on the road sharing the highway with folks who have this THC concentration within their bloodstream, and there's no way that we can tell whether they're disabled or, or able to drive their vehicles or not in a safe manner. That's scary. When I load up my three children in the car, and my wife, and we go driving down the street, if we legalize recreational use cannabis, and we know the rates will increase of people having the THC levels in their bloodstream, what are we doing? We're making our roads more hazardous for our families. That's, I don't want to put our kids in that situation. This, pro this can't be just fixed with another simple amendment. This is something that we have to work on from the substance of this bill, work on the structure of it. It's not a simple amendment. What about local control? Can you imagine? I live in East Grand Forks. North Dakota folks coming over from Grand Forks and the surrounding area, coming into East Grand Forks, one of the first things they're going to be seeing, of course, are probably billboards and shops uh, as this stuff springs up. Isn't that a great way to beautify our communities? To really advertise to those surrounding states that, hey, we're open for business, that's going to be our reputation as a state? I mean, we've done a lot of things this session that have given us a reputation. This just adds on to the pile of what Minnesota is. Minnesota used to be known as the state of Minnesota nice, right? It used to be a really clean state, parks, lakes, trails, now we're known for things like weed? It's, to me, that's a big letdown. That's something that cannot be fixed through an amendment. We talked a little bit about protecting our kids. We talked, Senator Abler had a great story about uh, children, people being affected, and families. Fundamentally, this bill puts our families at risk. The increased access to marijuana, to cannabis products, fundamentally will put our children at risk, our communities at risk. 
our businesses at risk. This is a bad bill, and it, the problems cannot simply be fixed with an amendment. So we can talk finally about the complexity of this bill. Look, if you want to go out and get a, uh, some, uh, a registration or a permit to sell, to wholesale, to, uh, to grow on the medical side, on the hemp side, there are 15 different licenses that you can choose from and a combination thereof. A lot of the benefits of these licenses go out to specific groups of people. So not open to all Minnesotans. It also puts money into the cannabis industry, growing it. So really pushing an industry into our communities, into our families, into the places that we live, work, it's astounding to me. We've been working so hard telling folks, hey, don't smoke, hey, don't drink, but here we're using the tax revenue to promote this business and grow it across the state. I don't know, to me that, that doesn't seem right, but that's what this bill does. If this bill is signed into law by Governor Walls without fixing these problems, Democrats with their single party control will have engaged in a dangerous and risky experiment with Minnesotans' lives. So make our roads less safe, put our children at risk, tell teenagers that drug use is safer than alcohol and tobacco. I'm sorry, but those who are voting for this bill, they will own every failing of this bill. Simply put, this bill is not ready. Minnesota is not ready for this bill. Vote red. Thank you. To the bill author, Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I was a co-author on this bill last term. It never got a hearing, so I uh, never got a chance to do any work on it. Senator Melissa lopez Franson carried it and handed off her incredible collection of resources when she retired. I raised my hand for this bill this year when I realized there wasn't an author because it fits squarely in my kind of politics. I believe strongly to my core that our politics should be centered on the people and that our deepest responsibility as a state, as the hand of government, is to protect our residents. With the prohibition of cannabis, with the war on drugs, we have not achieved any of the goals, but instead have done immeasurable harm to our people, disproportionately to people of color. It's unacceptable for the state to do that kind of harm, devastate communities, and walk away as though it's the price of doing business. We must rectify the, the situation. The solution must be centered on the people that have been the most harmed. So I took this bill, knowing the amount of work it was going to be, though maybe I didn't know exactly how much work it was going to be, because I wanted to ensure that this bill stayed centered on the humanity of this issue. Through this process, my door has always been open to meet with folks on all sides of the issue, no matter their concern, and listen to their suggestions. I've worked closely with the League of Minnesota Cities and the Association of Minnesota Counties. I've worked with the U of M, with Poison Control, with DPS, the state troopers, grieving parents, hemp farmers, racial justice advocates, Americans for Prosperity, the insurance industry, and the entire coalition at MN is ready. This list goes on and on. Thank you. Thank you for your engagement around this critical bill. This bill has been a joint effort, and I want to thank my team for their work. Courtney, I honestly don't know how you scheduled that many meetings into my schedule and kept all the suggestions and requests and resources organized. Jackie, you've been our researcher on this from day one. 
while also handling all of your regular job responsibilities. And I don't know how many hours that means you've worked at night and on weekends, but I want to thank you for that dedication, your knowledge, and the steady calm you brought to this work. Davin, thank you for joining the team after we finished our work on the Housing Committee. To the nonpartisan staff, Laura, Andrew, Nolan, Ken, Nora, Kyle, you've lent your expertise in a way that helped us build the strongest bill possible, taking suggestion after suggestion and crafting it into the correct language and putting it in the right place to build the bill we have before us. The revisers, your turnaround on engrossing and entering all the changes after each committee is nothing short of incredible. And to my buds, my co-authors, Aaron Murphy, Claire umover Baton, Senator Bolden, and Senator Putnam, thank you, especially Claire and Aaron, who took on presenting this bill in a couple of committee stops. But mostly, I want to thank every single person who took the time to call and email and meet with me and share the ways that we could improve this bill. With this legislation, we're blazing a trail with our new approach to legalization that fits Minnesota. And I think we'll see other states follow suit. This bill reflects the needs of our state, the input of voices across Minnesota, and centers the humanity of those who have been most harmed by past policies. Members, please join me. Vote green. Members, let me make one announcement before the, the secretary takes uh, the role on final passage of this bill. I make this announcement at the right before we vote on any big bill. I want to remind the gallery, as well as the folks upstairs, th that it is inappropriate to cheer or yell immediately after a vote. We still have some matters that we need to discuss. And so that is just a gentle reminder, because I know how sometimes our exuberance uh, get, uh, uh, takes over us at times. So that's a gentle re reminder. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, just for purposes of the audience, um, if you would give us the permission that once we uh, once we adjourn the Senate, then people would be available to cheer. <laughs> that authorization given after, after we, adjourn. we adjourn, not leading up to adjournment. <laughs> and in the meantime, you can go like this. No, don't do that, N neither. Quietly, quietly, just quietly. Thank you. Don't do that. Okay. The uh, secretary would take the final roll on House File 100. For final passage. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator Rasmussen for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abler votes no. Senator Abler votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Draskowski votes no. Senator Draskowski votes no. Senator Grunhagen votes no. Senator Grunhagen votes no. Senator Housley votes no. Senator Housley votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Howe votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Liskey votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Weber votes no. Senator Weber votes no. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Westrom votes no. And Senator Westrom votes no. Senator Morrison for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Bolden votes aye. Senator Bolden votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Mitchell votes aye. Senator Mitchell votes aye. Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Seaburger votes aye. Senator Seaburger votes aye. Senator Wicklin votes aye. Senator Wicklin votes aye. And Mr. President, Senator Kunish votes aye. And Senator Kunish votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 33 no. Yes. Sorry. No, wait. 34 ayes and 33 no's. The bill is passed and is title agreed to. See, I told you it would be someone who wouldn't listen.
Members, uh, there's a privileged report at the desk. Uh, Senator Morrison. Mr. President, is there a privileged report at the desk? There is a privileged report at the desk. The secretary will read the report. Senator Diedzik from the Subcommittee on Conference Committees recommends that the following senators be, and they are hereby appointed as, as the Conference Committee on House File Number 2887. Senators Dibble, Morrison, Carlson, McEwen, and Jasinski. House File Number 2292. Senators Kunish. Members, members. We are still in session. House file number 2292, Senators Kunish, Wickland, and Duckworth. Senator Dedzik moves the foregoing appointments be approved. To that motion, all in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. <laughs> Members, we will now proceed to the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interests. Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Draskowski, 10 to 1225 p.m. and 1230 to 3 o'clock p.m. Any, uh, any additional announcements of Senate interest? Seeing none, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, May 1st at 2 p.m. On that motion, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. The motion prevails. The Senate is now adjourned.